pressure looks good. All right, let's see if everything's going, folks. It's time for another NSF Live. I truly hope you can hear me right now. Uh, <laughs> let me know whether or not you can hear me, please. <laughs> five squared, five by five. Okay, that's oh, yeah. good. Whew. All right. <laughs> There's, there's a bug that happens on occasion where it looks like audio is being sent, but the audio is not actually being sent. It's something we've been worrying with for a while, but it's not happening right now, which is good. So since you can hear us, let's go ahead and get started with NSF Live here. We're a couple minutes late as we were working through that little technical glitch, but let's just say that that's going to be our bug, and we'll just keep pushing through it here today. Uh, for what we do, for what we do, for today, here is our plan. NSF Live is NASA Space Flight's uh, mostly weekly talk show where we just hop on and we open up the microphones and we open up the chat and we talk about what's going on in space news. Sometimes we check out what's going on with the launches. We look at what's happening live from Boca Chica. We'll go through different articles that came out, uh, different news, new imagery. That's what we do for NSF Live. And it's called NSF Live because it's live. We didn't call it NSF Dead um, because we're here <laughs> in real time responding to your feedback and uh, reading your chat and that sort of stuff. So as we go through the show today, uh, talk back with us. Tag us in chat at, at NASA Space Flight, and we will read your chat. And if we want to read it out loud, we'll do that sometimes. Uh, but <laughs> there's so many good so many good statements that come through, so many questions and stuff like that. We can't always get everything. I would be remiss to do this by myself, though. I couldn't do it by myself. I've got two friends with me here today. Uh, over on this side, we've got Thomas Burghardt. Thomas, your regular face around NSF Live. How you doing? Yeah, I'm around here fairly often. How's it going, everybody? Yeah, on occasion. Folks, please tell me you can hear Thomas. That would <laughs> <Yeah>. be nice. <laughs> can, can you hear Thomas? Like, 5x5 five five, Thomas, like, tell me Thomas's name with a 5x5. Five five. I'd appreciate you. Uh, and then while that information is coming in, uh, a new person that's hanging out here. Haven't seen your face very much. Uh, Tyler, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Doss, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to make my debut on NSF Live today. All right, so the first time uh, you've dialed in, and we appreciate you showing up to hang out with us. So, uh, Tyler, it's well, Thomas and Tyler, I don't even know how to introduce y'all, both writers. Thomas, you're on the stream all the time. Tyler, you've actually been to Boca Chica um, doing some Starship stuff, like you were supporting Starship operations out there. The first long-range robotic camera deployment. What else do you do for NASA Space Flight? Well, I'm mostly just a writer, write articles, I tweet, you know, <laughs> as writers often do. But, uh, and I sometimes go to launches whenever I can. And uh, the efforts down in Boca Chica, I'm only like six hours away. And uh, whenever I can make those trips and uh, chronicle those events, it's quite exciting. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be a part of it and, you know, cover those events for NSF. Yeah, good deal. So it's a pleasure to have you on the show here today. And we're going to begin talking about whatever we're supposed to talk about here. A lot of very interesting stuff happened in space news yesterday at four o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the Specifically, same time. In, in the hours before yesterday at four o'clock as well, but a, a lot of different things going on in space news. Thomas, do you want to sort of drive our order here? What are we talking about today uh, for our NSF live show? And while we're going through this, folks, remember, we're live. Tag us in chat with questions and comments and stuff like that. We've got some cool software that will pull it out as long as you test this uh, to tag us correctly so that we can answer questions. If you ask a question that's not relevant to what we're talking about, so we're talking about Starship and you're talking about zero point energy or the EM drive or something like that, then we're going to not probably talk about that question about Starship. Uh, but if you have a question about Starship, we're talking about Starship. We try to get contextual questions. So Thomas, take it away. Where are we starting today? What are, what are the things we're going to be looking at here? Yeah. So a lot, a lot of things happened this week and um, I'm going to go back to the first kind of really big news that on any other news week would have probably been our lead story for NSF Live this week. So Blue Origin, I'm going to go to West Texas and talk about Blue Origin's New Shepard launch really quick. They launched the New Shepard 15 mission, which 
turns out was likely the very last flight of New Shepard without humans on board before they fly their first crewed mission. Which again is a huge deal. They've been working through this for a long time, developing a whole new booster and capsule system to do my, uh, zero suborbital zero gravity flights with people on board for tourism and research purposes. They've been flying a lot of uncrewed research payloads, but haven't put researchers on board yet. And uh, we actually had NSF's own Jack Beyer out there in West Texas, a few miles away, to get us sort of a experimental live broadcast of the stream. Like again, Blorge Very doesn't give. Uh, yeah, Blorgen doesn't give press access to these things, so we kind of had to find a public road that Jack could pull over on. But uh, we did get some really cool views of New Shepard lifting off, and they had a perfectly successful mission. And uh, sort of, we had some sus some suspect that this was maybe the last uncrewed test flight. Uh, prior to the launch, they went ahead and did a sort of astronaut rehearsal where they had yep. some Blue Origin employees standing in as astronauts who actually got into the capsule. They closed the hatch. They did communications checks. And then, of course, they opened the hatch and let them back out because they weren't actually going to go to space today. But uh, they, and even after the landing, so the capsule comes back and touches down. They did the same thing, but reverse. They actually got back into the capsule, closed the hatch, and then practiced exit procedures and how to egress the capsule and stuff like that. Um, so they rehearsed all of those sort of astronaut human factors type uh, situations with a new Shepard launch. And uh, after the fact, Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos went to Instagram saying simply, it's time. So we believe that... <laughs> went to Instagram saying it's yes. time. I love it. <laughs> so New Shepard 16, which could occur later this year, will very likely be New Shepard's first human spaceflight attempt, um, which is very, very exciting. And like I said... A lot of people have been following this system. There's a lot of cool opportunities for people who are not astronauts, you know, everyday people who can afford the ticket um, to get on board and experience a little bit of space flight like that. Plus a very low cost and very reliable research platform for NASA and universities and all those kind of customers. So it's a very exciting system and we're very excited for them to get even closer to human space flight. And also we love this shot of the drone during the launch because it's awesome. Right? <laughs> Nobody's beat that drone shot where the rocket comes past the drone on the way. I'm not sure we'll get that when there's people people in that thing so, i hope so they should it would be cool but <laughs> you uh, see somebody's yeah. face like in the in the in the thing, like <laughs> sitting back in the <laughs> So yeah, that happened at sort of the near the beginning of this week, and um, we were like, well, that's going to be the big news this week. We'll talk about that on NSF Live. There won't be much else to talk about um, how, how wrong we were. But Little uh, did that, we know. Yeah, that's how the, crew, uh, the week started, and I actually want to make a slight parallel to another thing we want to quickly recap. As we all know, New Shepard uses those patented soft landing thrusters on the capsule touchdown yep which they got which i believe they got that idea from this other landing i'm going to talk about really quick <laughs> well i gotta uh, <laughs> i gotta say really quickly um, yeah. jack went out there jack rolled all the way out to west texas basically and i think what was going on was that jack just wanted to see this with his own eyes oh yeah it had nothing he's to been, do with broadcasting oh, yeah, for NSO. <laughs> yeah he's he's been chasing this for the longest time and uh, i get the impression that the number one thing that jack wanted to do was go to west texas and see this launch himself uh so we did the experimental broadcast i got to talk about the experimental, broad experimental broadcast really quickly we do it as members only so if you're a member for nasa space flight stream because we can't uh, guarantee the quality of it and we can't say, wow, we don't know if we're going to have signal. We haven't gone out there a week in advance and tested everything, like all these different things. We don't send out 400 notifications for stuff like this. Every single time we do one of these experimental streams, people are like, oh, my gosh, why didn't you notify us? Oh, members only. Oh, you have to pay for it. And we, we don't like that. We don't ever want to say, well, to get this content, you have to pay us. That's not how we are. But when we can't guarantee the quality or content, like we don't even know if we're going to see anything, sometimes we'll do an experimental stream like that. So if you're a member and you saw that, um, and if you're not a member and you didn't see that, that's sort of what was going on with that experimental broadcast. So I just I want to say that really quickly so people understand. We know when we go live, there should be something for you to see. And we're super, super, we're very careful. Like, we don't want to send out 400,000 notifications if we're not going to have signal and there's not going to be anything for you to see. Now, sometimes it's foggy in Boca Chica and we go live anyways, but <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, so that, that's, that's less important experimental for me to say more really quickly. yelling at clouds, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So anyways, Thomas, sorry about that. I, I had to make yeah, a note no. of that really quick. And we do also, like those experiment. experimental streams get simulcast on DOS's Twitch. So if you follow us on social media, we were publishing a public link where you did not have to pay to see the stream. Right. But DOS has a... Das has a lower, I don't know, I, don't, I was about to say a lower quality standard. That sounded mean. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dos doesn't <laughs> mind putting our experimental streams over on his Twitch channel, so he lets us do it there. <laughs> yeah, my, my Twitch viewers, it's it's a lower audience base. We're not sending out as many notifications, and yeah. they're used to experimental streams. I strapped a live stream camera to a chainsaw once and <laughs> chainsaw trees in my yard. So they're used to it over there. Um, so anyways, <laughs> y'all understand on Twitch, right? Um, but yeah, so, so that's here. what was going on. But we, we did get to see it and it was very cool. Um, yeah, you want to talk? So we want to talk about the other soft landing thruster spacecraft vehicle thing? Is yeah, it, sure. That, are we going to make that segue now? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so in the world of or, uh, human spaceflight, we also just last night had the return of three astronauts from the International Space Station. NASA astronaut Kate Rubin, uh, and then two Roscosmos cosmonauts, Sergei Ryzikov and Sergei Kuzvertskov. So Kate Rubin's plus two Sergeys uh, coming back <laughs> from the International Space Station on the Soyuz MS-17 spacecraft. Uh, ending their six months stay on the ISS and coming home safely. They touched down right after midnight Eastern time last night. And uh, not much to talk on that end because it went pretty much perfectly. And uh, that was the last kind of crew rotation uh, motion prior to the SpaceX Crew 2 mission coming up next week. Um, so the ISS staying busy with crew rotations and things like that. Uh, yeah, it, the space station crew is down to seven now. It'll go back up temporarily to 11 once Crew 2 arrives. And we brought that up because uh, the the Soyuz capsule touches down yeah. in very much the same way as the New Shepard. I should say that the other way around. New Shepard right. touches down in very much the same way as Soyuz, where it's got parachutes, and then when it touches down, it fires these like braking thrusters, which is why you get the uh, the big sort of plume of dust because thrust yeah. was created right how do we know there's yeah. dust created there's dust below the thing um and that is the same thing that blue origin does when their suborbital capsule touches down you get a big plume of dust because they've got braking thrusters as well right yeah yeah yep all right yep looks like a harder impact than it is but it's just those thrusters firing into the ground it's a whole lot of dust so no yep. worries. And there. we can't say astronauts successfully safely on the ground that was the other graphic i had to show so next topic <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's Kate Rubens back from her second space flight. Um, so yeah, those are just a quick launch and landing recaps for the week. Uh, we do want to talk about preparations for the next big orbital launch on the worldwide launch schedule, which is SpaceX Crew-2 from here on the Space Coast. SpaceX's second operational Crew Dragon flight, uh, the first human space flight to fly on a reused spacecraft since STS-135. Uh, we'll launch on board Crew Dragon Endeavor from the Demo 2 mission. And Falcon 9, oh god, what's the serial number for the Falcon 9? Wait, I don't have it off the top of my head. It's a P1061, thank you. Booster 1061-2 after the Crew 1 mission. So uh, the booster has also previously launched a human space flight mission, um, making their crew rotation flight up to the International Space Station. Two NASA astronauts, a French-European Space Agency astronaut, and a JAXA Japanese astronaut on board. And that's launching on April 22nd at 6.11 a.m. Eastern Time. This uh, Thursday morning, right? Yeah, this coming Thursday, correct. Yeah, Thursday um, morning Eastern yeah. Time. So Yes, uh, just this morning, they conducted the static fire test with the full stack over at 39A at 6.11 a.m. Eastern Time, the same time as the launch. They did a full sort of timely rehearsal of the launch day events. Uh, there's a picture of it there. And that went off successfully. SpaceX confirmed that test was good. Um, and that kind of culminates the last of the big pre-launch -re uh, reviews other than the launch readiness review, which will be coming up later this week. Um, but the flight readiness review went successfully and passed. Uh, there was one item that they noted about liquid oxygen loading. They actually said that SpaceX has discovered that they've likely been loading a couple extra inches of liquid oxygen on like every Falcon 9 for the last couple of years, which <laughs> okay. is not, not really a huge deal. But uh, they just like, uh, they were doing some testing before Crew 2 and they realized that that was probably happening. Um, it's not a safety concern or anything like that. They're going to keep an eye on it and potentially correct it, but it doesn't really have adverse effects, so it doesn't really matter. Um, that was the only I, item. I gotta they ask, it, is that how they measure it in inches? You think it'd be like kilograms or something? Like you said, yeah, inches. Is I, that? I think it had something to do with they did yeah. a de they did a detanking either after a static fire or after um, some other testing at McGregor or something, and realizes there were like a few inches of locks left. Left I guess that's yeah. I guess that's in that scenario. That's kind of how you measure it. And like normally, you would talk about like kilograms yeah. or some sort of volume yeah. measurement. But 
Um, yeah, I guess the, the, the way they were talking about it at the flight readiness review was inches of liquid oxygen. So there you go. Inches of liquid oxygen. Mix it up their units, too. Jeez, you'd expect it would be yeah. like centimeters of liquid oxygen or something. Yeah. Also, technically, in, inches of liquid oxygen could be a pressure measurement, technically. <laughs> but I, let's, not, let's not talk about that. That's getting complicated. Like inches complicated. of mercury, right? Right, exactly. Right, move yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing yeah. to see that, here. That, that goes into a whole uh, another But yeah, that, they, yeah, they waive that. They, SpaceX requested an extension, yeah. and NASA had no problem. Or uh, not an, an exception, excuse me. And NASA granted that with no problem. There wasn't any concerns there. So flight readiness review was go. Uh, vehicle rolled out, conducted its static fire test. And then also the most important component of the Crew 2 stack are the astronauts who are now also at the Kennedy Space Center. They arrive and laughing. And laughing. Yeah, Thomas Pisquet, the French astronaut, is hilarious, by the way. Um, the 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 crew press conference, he was the last one to go. So he's like, well, it's unfair. I don't get to introduce anyone. So look at uh, Megan's shoes because they're really cool. I don't know. <laughs> he was look like Doc Martens or something. They're yeah, like, I, he said that, wearing? and then we never got any close-up images of what the shoes are. So I don't know what's so cool about oh them. But apparently, she's wearing cool shoes. Yeah, they've got like the stitching across the front, and it looks like the sole and the heel of like Doc Martens. I had those when I was in high school. I uh, saw something that uh, she actually got voted out for wearing matching <laughs> shoes. Uh, she voted against it, but the rest of the crew said, "No, you're gonna wear matching <laughs> shoes, and you're gonna." <laughs> <laughs> that so, is uh, one of the cool things you can see in this photo, right? Um, I was looking, and you're like, "Oh yes, this astronaut." And it's it's cool because we've got two NASA patches, right? Yep. Right here, there's a NASA patch. There's a NASA patch. But oh, we also have the telestration, guys. You know, DOS is I'm working on it. Yeah, I needed an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and we also had an ESA yeah. patch. So yeah. three <laughs> different space programs. Is that the right way to say it? Three different space agencies space, space represented. Agencies, in, yeah. Yeah, space agencies represented, which is really cool. Yeah, so from left to right, I'm going to get all their names really quick. So on the left is Thomas Pesquet, who will be the first European astronaut to fly on a U.S. commercial crew vehicle um, representing the nation of France. And then to his uh, his left, our right, are the two NASA representatives. The pilot is Megan MacArthur, and then the commander is Shane Kimbrough. And then the Japanese representative all the way on the right is Aki Akihiko Hoshi, Hoshi, Hoshidi. I don't know if I pronounced that I think, right. I think it's Hoshide. Yeah. Hoshide, okay. Um, who is the Japanese astronaut, the second Japanese astronaut to fly on Crew Dragon. And of course, he will join Soichi Noguchi up on the International Space Station before Crew 1 comes back. So that should be uh, two Japanese astronauts on orbit at the same time, which hasn't happened since the shuttle, I believe. I almost labeled uh, Megan as being from the NSA. I corrected that. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw the corrections there. Like, Wait a second, what do and, I do? Uh, Anyways, very cool. And, uh, and a bit of synergy to note here. Megan, Megan MacArthur is actually Bob Bacon's wife. And as you may remember, Bob Bacon flew on Demo 2, the first crew flight of crew And was so, the pilot. So uh, she'll be know, sitting in, exactly. in Bob's seat, actually. <laughs> same exact seat on the same exact capsule. It's very yeah. cool. I've, I've got this from the museum show because I just did a museum show with uh, Dan... Hewitt from you've seen him on the NASA, NASA yeah. live streams before, right? And he gave us this graphic. So here you've got Bob and Doug, right, yep. in their seats, and then we also have Megan in the same position in the yep. different capsules. I had I wouldn't in the dock, but I had that from my assets from my other show. So there you go, same seat. Uh, same wait a second, same seat, seat, different capsule, same seat. Nope, same capsule. Same this, capsule is Dragon and, this is Dragon same Endeavor, capsule, which also launched yeah. the Demo 2 mission. Ah, I should have worn my shirt. I don't have the right shirt. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm saving my Endeavor t-shirt for when I go down to cover the launch. I'm going to wear it on launch day for sure. <laughs> <laughs> See, the problem is I've got one of the Dragon Endeavor shirts that was the original like test shirts. And the oh, logo. Oh, so the logo, it's way too low, right? It's like on my oh, stomach. Yeah. And if I have it on the show, I have to like go like this to show it like all the way up. This is my, this is my elite dangerous history of flight. Uh, no. <laughs> shirt that i had on today so That's anyways anyways <laughs> so crew two coming up of course we're going yes. to be doing live coverage of that on thursday the other cool thing about the crew two launch is the time that it's taking off with that early morning uh pre-dawn launch time we're hoping we get a nice jellyfish effect y'all seen the jellyfish before where you get the big plume that's uh the, you know the lit up plume where the ground is in darkness and the rocket flies into the rays of the sun from like basically going around the corner of the earth and getting sun on it directly and so we get this big plume effect and we're hoping that we get that right 
Yes, and if, if it launches on that time on Thursday, yeah. it should. On Thursday, because it's that pre, it's like 30 minutes before sunrise and 30 yeah. minutes after sunset, and you get this yeah. really big plume effect where it's just really highlighted. The rocket exhaust lit by the sun is is a really amazing effect. So for a crew launch to to do that is going to be really cool to see. Yeah, and that's basically and also. Oh, and also worth noting that the uh, if the launch gets delayed uh, to the 23rd, then T uh, zero would get delayed or pushed earlier by about 20 or so yep. minutes each right. day. So uh, Thursday would be the most likely day to see that jellyfish effect because as you get earlier in the morning, uh, the likelihood yeah. of that decreases. And we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on the first weather forecast should come out on Monday for that launch at L minus uh, four. So we'll keep an eye for that to see how likely that Thursday date is to hold um, everything technically on track. Of course, weather could do what Florida weather does. So we'll see. Um, but uh, NASA space flight, assuming it holds, NASA space flight will be bringing live coverage starting at about four hours before launch, somewhere around 2 a.m. Eastern. Exact schedule to be determined, but uh, we will of course have our live coverage for that crew launch uh, from the Kennedy Space Center. So stay tuned for that on Thursday morning. Should be good. Yeah, absolutely. And and really quick, y'all, um, we do these shows. We've got lots of topics to go through, but I just wanted to take a second. Thank you so much for all the super chats that y'all are singing. I mentioned at the beginning, but let me see if I can't thank a couple of the supporters. We wouldn't be able to do these shows without the super chats. So let me see if I can't grab some of those really quickly. Thomas Anfang, we appreciate you there. <laughs> oh, this is, I feel like you should hold on to this because it's Starship related. I'm going to hold on to that one, Thomas. Thank okay. you. Anyways, uh, Moldy Space Industry snuck through saying, Thomas Tyler Gang, thank you, Moldy <laughs> Space, for the five bucks. <laughs> we got Tony Parkinson, a new member, joining the NASA Space Flight crew there. A fantastic way to support us on a regular basis. Those monthly memberships are a huge sort of recurring stream of revenue for us so that we can continue to increase our coverage and keep these shows going. So thank you, Tony, for that support. Um, we've got Jim Cavett here saying happy weekend. Anton Mel as well with a couple of euros into the hat. <laughs> we've got Andy Law. This was from when we were talking about uh, that blue, the, uh, the, the, the blue origin launch. Um, thanks to Jack for coverage from the corn ranch, Van Horn, Texas. <laughs> Iowa approves the ranch name, by the way. And Very then we've true. got uh, Stuart Wilson, Keep pushing the info. You're yeah. the best value on the interweb. Like, wait, like us? You're the best value on the. I like that, it. That, that's high praise. I appreciate it. Yeah, Steve. <laughs> the best value. Yeah, yeah. you can win contracts yeah. by I being the best value. So much. Um, <laughs> 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 Alan Curtis is a new membership as well. Thank you very much. Uh, things that had like super chats that had questions. I'm going to hold those until they're relevant to what we're talking about. I think this isn't a question. Yoff. S. Jones says, to the moon, go SpaceX, go Starship, go Dragon, go Falcon 9, all sorts of SpaceX spaceships in there. Matthew, the Eagle, I guess, is a new membership. We've got CAMP Railroad. Thanks for stopping through. Um, <laughs> Megan's going to show her husband how to really drive a Dragon capsule. Nice, CAMP. <laughs> Um, Copper Core is a new membership as well. And there were a couple other Super Chats that came through. I'm going to hang on to those till they're relevant because they're more questions uh, than anything else. Also, I know that we're sort of holding some of our questions about the... We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the Crew 2 launch, right? An entire live stream dedicated to that. Tons of time for Q&A on that. Um, the Blue Origin suborbital launch didn't take in really any questions there. We're saving our time for the topics we know there's going to be a ton of questions on. Right. We cool? We cool. Yeah. All, right. All right. So thank yeah. you all for the support. Um, and thank you for understanding how I'm holding some of those questions and comments till till they come up to a relevant thing. What's next, Thomas? We've talked about crew two. Which I think leaves the other big SpaceX news from, like you said, four o'clock yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> or, or two o'clock, one o'clock yesterday, depending on who you follow on Twitter. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. So I'll give a very brief background about what happened and why we had none of us saw it coming and then we're going to dive straight into details and q a i'm already working on an article covering this topic too that will show up on nesselspaceflight.com hopefully later today we were we're going to cover this in its entirety but we wanted to dedicate most of nsf live for this big news because it's well it's the biggest news and i know there's gonna be a lot of questions so True. what happened yesterday early in the day rumors started to come out that nasa had selected the human landing system design 
Are you spoiled the answer, Dustin? <laughs> <laughs> there was no suspense. Uh, this is just like show it on screen. Doesn't matter. Just show it on screen. <laughs> so chat, raise rumors... your hand if you didn't know who they selected. Okay. <laughs> that's, all right, that's fair. You know, <laughs> if you're following our channel, you probably yeah. knew already. This is like uh... you spoiled Avatar. Avatar came out like 20 years ago. Yeah. Right? <laughs> really? <laughs> they plug exactly. into the tree. It's a neural network. Anyways. <laughs> um... <laughs> So NASA, the rumors started coming out that NASA had selected their moon lander for the Artemis program. Turns out, in fact, they had selected SpaceX's sort of st <laughs> sort of Starship <laughs> variant, the lunar, the human landing system variant of Starship. Uh, you've got a brand new render of it. It looks like they've tweaked the design a little bit. We'll talk about that. Uh, but the, the big news is that not only that NASA selected Starship to be their Artemis moon lander, at least their first Artemis moon lander, but that they also only selected Starship. <laughs> it's hard news. to keep commentary going while DOS telestrates, um, guys. DOS is having too much fun right now. <laughs> is that the point of an SS Live? Like, all yeah. week long we do yeah. super serious streams? No, we don't. All right, whatever. No, we don't. <laughs> Anyways, no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so all, not only did they select Starship, they only selected Starship. The two other entries, one from the Blue Origin-led national team and one from Dynetics, uh, neither of those have been selected to proceed at this time. Doesn't mean they could never fly. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. But the initial award for the first uncrewed demonstration mission and a crew demonstration mission have gone to SpaceX. Uh, and they will fly on this sort of variant of their Starship vehicle. Uh, their human landing system is what NASA is calling that program. The HLS. HLS. Yeah, HLS. Or yeah. how would Chris say it? H. HLS? HLS, yeah. Because Chris B would say it. Yeah. HLS, <laughs> if you're across the pond. But uh, that is very big news. So the uh, the big takeaway that NASA is moving forward with this design, SpaceX was awarded just under about $3 billion. Um, it's some oddly specific number. If you look at contract awards, there's always yeah. some really weird number down to like almost the I, cents. I, I think I can remember the number. Oh. It's too, yeah, I'll see if I can do this correctly. I'm terrible with receiving numbers. Very specific. I'll see. Yeah, 2941000000 Three hundred ninety-four thousand five hundred fifty-seven. I think is the there. number. I don't know if I got. I think I got that. Plus a penny correct, on the end. But that very specific. <laughs> yeah, it's a very specific number. But um, I don't know why it was so specific. But that's the award they were granted in. The, and we'll actually talk about that a bit. So. That was not the uh, amount that SpaceX proposed or bid for their human landing system development. They actually asked for more than that. And so we're going to talk about that too. Um, basically, the reason they only selected Starship is that NASA is given from Congress their funding for different parts of the NASA, various NASA programs. Human landing system gets its own sort of line in the budget. So they're limited as to how much money they can spend in a year on the human landing system. And the amount that Congress allocated for this program was not enough to cover even the SpaceX bid, which was the cheapest of the three bids. And so they went to SpaceX and said, look, okay, you guys are the cheapest, but we also can't even afford you guys right now. Um, so what they went, they went into some contract negotiations because it was close and SpaceX basically was able to tweak how much they will get paid for different milestones along the way so that their current NASA budget covers the milestones they need for the next year or maybe it was the next two years um i forget exactly what the timeline is right. but basically the budget that nasa has been allocated so far covers the milestones that spacex needs for that timeline and they moved some of the payments to later milestones under the presumption that the budget would be adjusted accordingly later on so um, we, thomas yeah. really quickly was that two point a lot billion dollar number yeah. um <laughs> Was that just for the first couple of years or was that for the entire thing all the way up to putting boots on the moon? Right. So that covers the first two missions as well as all of the development that happens up to that point. So up to that point, vehicle okay. development, actually developing the vehicle and making it, building it. And then the uncrewed demonstration mission and the crewed demonstration mission and all of the like refueling flights that support those and things. All of that is covered under the just under three billion dollars. However, right. that's so what I should say is that covers NASA's contribution to those missions because SpaceX right. will also be putting a lot of their own resources towards that, not least because Starship is a vehicle they're going to use for their own commercial purposes anyway. They've already developed, you know, the Raptor engine already exists. NASA doesn't need to pay for anything regarding that. Um, the money goes towards the human landing system specific things. So, for example, we see a new landing leg design in this render that might be specific to lunar applications. So funding will go towards that. 
Um, if you look just under the big band of solar panels, you'll see a bunch of really tall, those landing thrusters that SpaceX has been working on. And that's actually slightly different from previous renders. So it looks like the design for those enhanced. may have changed a bit. Enhance! Right here, right? Uh, yeah, enhance, sorry. So those soft like, landing thrusters, because they don't want to land on the big, powerful Raptor engines on the moon. Uh, so development of those per that particular system will be funded from that $2.9 billion. Um, the elevator that they're going to use to get payloads and crew from the too. crew cabin back down to the surface, that will likely come from that funding. So the things that are specific to NASA's applications of this program will get funded with that money. And there's some humans for scale to show you how big Starship is. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to do the, the yeah. scroll there, but this is like the little elevator cage they're talking about. And then you scroll up Starship. <laughs> For a while. <laughs> and here's the hole in the side of it where you actually get out. Because remember, if you're an avid tank watcher, um, the entire bottom of Starship is the fuel tanks. It's yep. the methane and the, the LOX tanks. And so if you're riding on a Starship, I'm trying not to zoom this out to the wrong scale there. But if you're riding on a Starship, this is all, well, you still got the Raptors tucked up under a skirt. I don't know exactly where it is. Yeah, about but then you got there. A, yeah, about there. Then you got a yeah. big LOX tank, unless they flip it around on us. And then you got a methane tank, right? I don't know if that's the way they're going to keep Lunar Starship. It should be about then, that, yeah. Yeah, then up yeah. here is where you have the actual cargo area. So if you land a Starship on the moon, you're stuck up here. <laughs> and you've got to get down <laughs> from there to the surface of the moon. And as cool as it would be to jump into a backflip like a Kerbal, I think NASA would have <laughs> rated that like a significant risk <laughs> in their assessment. Yeah, I don't know, man. When I play Kerbal, you just use the RCS to get back up anyway. You don't need a ladder or an elevator or anything. Yeah. It's like $1 billion is to yeah, fund the development of a jetpack they can use to fly up and down from the... Anyways, Tyler, what were you saying? Oh, sorry, I, I jumped on you there. Oh, no, I was just... Um, you can carry on. I was just... Uh, <laughs> we can definitely carry on, that's guys. for sure. <laughs> um... So, but, Thomas, uh, I, yeah, I wanted to jump on something. You, you said that they went back and uh, they didn't have the budget for SpaceX. And so the number that SpaceX was awarded was less than they asked for. But I, that's not the way I read the document, because um, I've read this big document. I don't even know if I should bring that up on the screen or not, because it's just 24 pages of text. Right. Yeah. You know, we were um, talking about this. Right? You know, Das was asking for the link for it. I'm like, I didn't think we were going to yeah. show that. It's just a 24 page do government document. But I, can, if you want. I can. I can bring it over here. There it is. Want to read but, some uh, legalese on NSF Live? <laughs> there it yeah. is. Um, um, so uh, <laughs> what I was looking at there, I thought that when they went back, like, like you said, they're awarding these contracts, and they're like, okay, we want to get to the moon. And we have these phases of development where we want to have a demo, an uncrewed demo mission, and then we want to have a demo mission that's actually crewed with astronauts, and we put boots on the moon, right? Um, here's how much it's going to tell us how much it's going to cost. And when SpaceX came back, they looked at it and they're like, we can't even afford this. SpaceX was, I'm going to use the term, two point something billion dollars, super cheap, right? Yeah. Significantly cheaper than the other options. But even at that amount, they couldn't afford it. And they went back to SpaceX and said, you know something, we can't, we can't afford this. Like, we want to give you this contract, but we don't have this much money. And it wasn't a, oh, well, we'll shave a billion dollars off or anything like that. The way I read the document was SpaceX just sort of shuffled the coconuts around right. and said, OK, here's what you can afford now. We'll take it, clearly. Um, <laughs> and then later, we're going to move some of this stuff from up front and we're going to move it back here to the end. Was I reading that incorrectly? Yeah, correct. Like, nope, I, that's correct. OK. okay. So the total price yeah, for right. Starship human landing system development slash operations is, has not changed. Um, it and didn't was, change. OK. And explicitly, in fact, when they went into contract negotiations, SpaceX was not allowed to change anything about the design or the technical aspects of the design. They were only allowed right. to tweak how NASA will pay for it so that the congressional budget allows for it to do so. Um, so, right. yeah, they basically they took they some of the money. In... Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, they couldn't go back in and say, oh, geez, you can't afford that. Well, scratch the elevator. You're jumping. Like, right. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they couldn't do, do anything that, like that. Right? Um, they <laughs> okay, basically yeah. took some of the money that said, okay, NASA, instead of paying us this money now, you will pay this chunk of money later. Um, so the, right. the overall price doesn't stay the same, just the schedule as to which milestones earn which amount of money was changed. It's, it's very much like a, I shall gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Thank yeah. You. Exactly. You don't get that it's, reference. I, I, I don't get that reference. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I that's correct, but I don't know I if that's a reference. reference. Don't worry. 
Don't worry. Don't worry. No, thanks, I'm Tyler. <laughs> Thomas, I'm gonna start just like I'm gonna sign you up for a DVD club or something. It's like monthly DVDs to your it's inbox. Like two shows in a row where there's a reference I don't get. Yeah. Oh no. That's okay. That's but, I don't know what else I should show, by the way. I've got different renderings, but just Well, we've got you should show the the render from Matt Crawford, which is cool. And although and like luckily the Mooner lo, Mooner Wait, Oh my god. This one too, playing too is much. This the one you wanted to show? Yeah, that one. Playing too much girl. Which is very cool because these are now right now the two Artemis vehicles. You've got the crew launch vehicle that will deliver the crew to lunar orbit on Orion and SLS, even though that's an SLS block 1B. It would be a block 1, but close enough. And then the lunar starship, which is the lander that they'll board in lunar orbit and then go down to the surface, launching on Super Heavy. Uh, These are your two Artemis program launch vehicles right now. In addition to Falcon Heavy will launch the Gateway, a bunch of robotic landers will launch on a bunch of different rockets. There are other ones too, but these are your two main Artemis launch vehicles. But, But, Thomas... Yeah, Can't go humans on. just ride Starship into space? Why do they need SLS? Very good question. And they could, but yep. uh, that would require crew rating that big super heavy booster, which would be a task. I mean, it will happen eventually. SpaceX wants to fly yep. humans on Starship launches from Earth on super heavy, but they're not they're not there yet. They haven't flown a super heavy test flight yet. Um, the starships they are testing. Well, and there's also that I'm getting there, Daz. <laughs> Sorry. The starship prototypes they're still testing right now have failed to not explode so far, so they're still working on that. Failed um, to not explode. So to reduce the risk, there they're going to launch the starship human landing system uncrewed to first low Earth orbit, and then they're going to refuel it using the tanker variant. Obviously, on orbit refueling will be a very early part of their orbital demonstrations for the Starship system, not least of which because it's needed for human landing system. Um, And then once the lunar Starship is still uncrewed but fully fueled, it will maneuver itself out to lunar orbit, and then that is where it will meet its crew, which was launched on Orion on SLS. And SLS has a whole bunch of flight heritage to build off of. It's got the Space Shuttle main engines, now called the RS-25s. It's got the Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters. It's got a core stage, which is basically a stretched shuttle external tank. You've got an upper stage that is a Delta IV upper stage that's flown several times before. Um, and then you've got the Orion spacecraft, which has, like Das pointed out, a launch abort system. So should anything go wrong during ascent, the crew has a tested and true or, or, uh, abort system to bring them to safety. Oh, d- so a, there's an a abort l- system. Yes. <laughs> it, it, like, I should just say, just, it just has an abort it system. It has an abort which, system. <laughs> yeah. Which Starship will not have. Starship will rely on flying, you know, hundreds of times on uncrewed launches to prove its reliability, kind of similar to the Space Shuttle program, testing out various components and doing a lot of extensive testing to prove its reliability rather than relying on an abort system. Right, which is interesting because um, the Space Shuttle program got so much flack for blackout periods and launch where there was, it's like, oh yeah, here, we're going to do this. The shuttle does a backflip and then glides in for a landing at the Cape. And they're like, what? And then a miracle of Clara's was written on the light board, the, the whiteboard yeah. somewhere. Um, it's, it's interesting that reliability is our abort system. Yeah, which it's a different approach. And of course, yeah. the there are potential that the design gets tweaked or that there's some contingency abort modes. We were actually talking about this last time. If a sort of non- explosive failure happens during the super heavy phase of flight where you have to sh- you you lo- you have to shut down too many engines to safely get to orbit or some other problem occurs that doesn't prevent your propulsion systems from working right. but you have some other contingency okay. scenario there is potential for starship to kind of abort to orbit go to a low orbit one that's potentially different from the one it was supposed to go to and then come back down to earth uh, normally or potentially perform a boost back burn and come land at the launch site um starship will have the performance to do both of those things it just is a matter of can it get away from the booster and right. you know because if the booster explodes yeah. that's a where well, you need a launch escape system yeah um, but the lunar starship yeah. wouldn't be able to do that correct the and starship- in fact Right. Right. No Starship variant will likely be able to do that. The reason being that it doesn't have like a Super Draco abort system like Crew Dragon does. It doesn't have a launch escape tower like Orion does. Those things that are designed to start very, very quickly and get the crew away. Um, a Raptor engine takes a couple seconds to spool up. It's a big liquid-fueled engine. Right. And so you can't use those as an abort system. Um, so yeah, Starship will not have a launch abort system. Um, and for that reason, since they're going to take some time to prove the reliability needed to not have an abort system, they cannot launch the humans for the Artemis program on a crew rated starship. It's just not going to be crew rated in time. Yeah. 
it, it, that, that's an interesting thing to me, right? It, it's like, well, you know, why don't they just launch the humans on the starship? Why, why not scratch this entire thing out of the equation, SLS, and just use starship, right? And it still seems like they, they want to have some options mm-hmm. where SLS, super expensive, whatever you might think about it, um, but they're from the get-go designing to crew rate it. Could we still be on the same time frames if we were trying to crew rate starship, almost a complete greenfield design for humans um and still get boots on the moon by that time frame it just seems like there's a lot of different paths to get there and Mm -hmm. as of right now they still have sls in the loop they still have orion in the loop clearly a lot of stuff has been done um i want to ask what other things like what other fallback plans for getting human boots on the moon do y'all see in case SLS is delayed, like we don't want to be in a situation in case SLS is delayed. <laughs> I just said that out loud. Um, in yeah. case SLS isn't ready to go, but Lunar Starship is, what do you think happens there? Can we still go to the moon? I would be hard pressed to think of a scenario where Lunar Starship is ready to go, is not ready to go when Orion is. And when Orion which is. Feels weird to bet on sls to be ready first but yet just keep in mind where these two programs are the first sls is in the process of getting shipped to the launch site to be stacked for launch the hardware all exists there is an intact super heavy booster does not exist (laughs) well they made one but it didn't fit in the building yeah right and and it's not intact anymore so like i said an intact super heavy does not exist yeah they have great program Um... management right there (laughs) (laughs) minimizing (laughs) risk (laughs) <laughs> and then the, the lunar starship of course exactly. doesn't exist yet starships exist test prototypes exist flying prototypes exist prototypes that hop and then hop again in explosive fashion exist but you know we're, we're, they're still working on that so um as far as fallback options orion is the only crew spacecraft that has the systems needed to support a deep space mission um starship is not there yet none of the low earth orbit vehicles like crew dragon or starliner or i don't know soyuz or something yeah. they can't go to deep space um so saving some sort of low earth orbit rendezvous cough cough constellation program gestures at aries one poster um <laughs> which is not the current plan um you would have to drastically change your plans to kind of make something like that work um basically you're relying on sls and orion and then your moon lander which is currently starship yeah, because because right now, right, yeah. and, and Tyler, jump in anytime you want. I know we talk a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't know, we're not trying to be intimidating. Oh, we just talk a lot. Um, to oh, chat knows. So right now, these boosters exist. Yep. They're stacked. They're the same things yep. that were on the space shuttle. There's there's one more segment in them, so they're a little bit bigger, a little bit more ener- energy in them. But they exist. They're in the VAB right now, right? They're in the VAB. They're in the VAB. They're not in that little yes, side. Yes, they're stacked on the mobile launcher they're inside the yeah. on the mobile. Yeah. And then the center yeah. core. I mean, these yeah, things certainly just... exist. It flew on yeah. space shuttle, right? They did that full duration uh, hot fire yeah. test that they got through after one sort of misstep there. But they exist. They flew on space shuttle. And then this whole thing exists. Like you said, it's sort of a stretched uh, external tank for the shuttle, right? And that piece of hardware exists already. And then the upper stage is the, what is it, ICPS? Yeah, well, so this render is, yeah. yeah ICPS. I probably want to explain the difference what? in this render. Yeah. Really quick. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so for the first three launches of SLS, uh, NASA selected to use essentially the upper stage from the Delta IV and Delta IV heavy rockets called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. And yeah, it will have four all 10 engines. Uh, but eventually, after, or from Artemis IV and beyond, NASA will use uh, the Exploration Upper Stage, or EUS. And there'll be a much more powerful. Uh, upper stage with gotcha. uh, higher so cargo. Does that exist yet? So, Have they built the EUS yeah. or like like which one would be used for this pro like this part of the program? Getting astronauts it, to the moon for the dem uncrewed demo and then crewed demo. So so EUS does not exist yet uh, technically. They have, okay. Uh, a working vehicle has not been built, so they. And it takes time to develop that sort of thing, of course. So uh, in the interim, of course, uh, I in the ICPS, NASA is elected to use that uh, gotcha. use that upper stage until EUS gets ready. And of course, uh, NASA and Congress have been going back and forth about uh, using EUS and funding it and whether or not it should be canceled. But 
as of now, they're pretty set on using gotcha. EUS for Artemis foreign future Artemis missions. Uh, so we could see EUS being used on uh, future Artemis missions involving Starship yeah. and possibly other lunar vehicles. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, good but, deal. Uh, so, so I will not. Yeah. I mean, could they use or are they supposed to be using the the interim cryogenic propulsion stage to rendezvous with the lunar Starship for this? Like that's that's like just to hit the nail on the head. Which one are they using for this? Do we know? Yeah, for this one, they're using the ICPS, which is okay. the S, and that configuration for, is referred to as for, for, SLS Block for, One, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, which will have which, and this render shows Block One B with the EUS. Um, so the render yeah. is slightly off, but gotcha. Um, the SLS Block One, the first three at least SLS vehicles, um, <laughs> will use the ICPS, and that will be the one to launch Orion to rendezvous with Lunar Starship. Right. And and so going up the rest of the chain here, I mean, we'd have ICPS, which already exists, and we have exactly. Orion, which exists. already exists. Yeah, it exists. The launch escape system on the top exists. And it's nice to have if you're an astronaut going to the yeah. moon, um, or at least leaving the ground. <laughs> this is the right <laughs> way to say that. Um, so most of this stuff already exists. Has it flown yeah. and blown up a lot? No, um, but nope. there's hardware that exists for this program. And you look over on no. the Starship side of things, Yes, they built BN1. They've scrapped BN1. None of this. Well, I guess I could, to be fair, I guess I could. Uh, oops, I erased everything. I could circle some Raptors because Raptors yeah, exist. The Raptors exist. That's true. They exist. And the grid fins exist. The grid fins exist. We've seen those on our truck. You're right. Yeah. Um, oh, no big deal, yeah. Doss. This is just a big stainless steel tube. I mean, that's probably yeah. a fair thing to say, right? Yeah. That's what we've been saying about Starship the entire time. The Starship segment is more complicated with the aerodynamic surfaces yeah. and stuff. Right. The rest of it, a booster is just a big stainless steel tube with some avionics, right? Um, so maybe that maybe that's yeah. fair. And then this sort of exists. I'm going to draw a wavy line. Yeah. It's because it exists. exists. <laughs> yeah, it's because it exists. It's like Grandpa exists or something. No, <laughs> Hopper's probably the Grandpa. Yeah, Hopper's um, Grandpa, for sure. <laughs> Hopper's the Grandpa. Hopper yeah. lost an eye. I don't know if you saw that. Very grandpa -y. I like, saw that. <laughs> a light burned Just out. Just to... Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, just to mention real quick, uh, it was talking about Raptors. Not only do those sea level Raptors the vacuum exist Raptors. on the bottom of Super Heavy, they've also been testing vacuum Raptors in McGregor's. So right. Those, uh, what they call so, RVACs, exist um, as well. Just coming down, uh, it, it seems right like now. NASA keeping SLS in the mix. Think what you will about that. Maybe it's. Maybelline, maybe it's politics. I don't know <laughs> what it is, right? Actually, we probably do know what it is. I just, well, um, <laughs> I'll offer my opinion because this is sure. NSF Live and I'm allowed to do that here. Yeah. It yeah. Would, doesn't make any sense to remove SLS from the equation at this point. We just gave you a whole list of reasons why you shouldn't put crew on the SLS, on or excuse yeah. me, on, um, Starship on Starship launches from Earth on, with Super Heavy. Don't do it yet. It's That's a bad idea right now. In yeah. five to ten years, it will probably be a very good idea and we'll probably be doing it by then. <laughs> Right. But next year, don't do it. That's a bad idea. Yeah. Their SLS has so many, and Doss was saying, like, has this stuff flown and blown yeah. up? No. But a lot of it has flown and not blown up. Shuttle right. boosters, shuttle main engines, the ICPS have all flown before. Even the even the abort system has been tested. Right, and Orion right. had it. Orion kind of had a test flight. It yeah. was just the capsule, and it was kind of a bare bones capsule. Yeah. But a, a an Orion capsule has done a space flight as well as an abort test. Um, actually, a couple abort abort yeah. tests. Yep. So, yeah, so there, there's a, a lot more reliability built into SLS right now at the cost of it being a lot very expensive. There's been right. delays in that program. Um, but all, all things considered, it would, it would be the smartest decision yeah. is to continue using both of these vehicles because um, you retire a lot of risk by launching it uncrewed, getting it refueled, and get, delivering it to lunar orbit ready to go um, before any people get on board. That's a very safe way to handle this. Yeah. It is also go Tyler, yeah. Yeah. And of course, oh, oh okay. I was just going to say that uh, in the uh source selection statement for the HLS award, NASA uh issued a risk towards uh the Starship HLS for uh doing uh, what they call a complex uh series of operations where you uh launch tankers and the lunar starship, well, whether how many tankers they're going to use to fill up the lunar starship who knows but uh you have a complex series of things going on you have the launches and the landings of the super heavy boosters and the tanker starships coming back 
you have to refurbish and refly those vehicles, and then you have to rendezvous starships together in orbit and dock them together and transfer uh, cryogenic propellants over, right. which has never been done before. So it's a very complex, uh, yeah, very complex yeah. dance, so to speak. You have to, it has to all be choreographed in such a way that you could do it quickly and efficiently. Of course, that's very hard. And NASA issued a risk for that, but uh, they said those risks were tempered because Starship can do all these things in low Earth orbit and then go to the moon rather than just doing it all in lunar orbit, which would, if an issue right. crops up, would be very hard to fix. So, or harder to fix than if you weren't yeah. in, than if I, you were I, in I low Earth orbit. I have trouble so. finding a lot of fault with uh, that. Yeah, it, that, that makes sense. And, and, you know, I am a big proponent of going to the moon to shake down all your equipment so that you can go to Mars, right? Mm -hmm. I get it. I, I understand the arguments on both sides. Like, oh, just skip it. Just go straight to Mars. Yeah. Um, I use my camping perspective. Like, if I'm going to go camping, I shake down all the gear in the backyard to make sure I have all my tent stakes and I'm not missing the fuel for my stove and all that sort of stuff just in my backyard because that's the easy place to, to fix it. Right, as opposed to going all the way on the camping trip and then realizing that you forgot your tent. Um, that's sort of sort of how I think about it, and it's the same sort of thing that they were saying in that selection document, yeah. where yes, there's a lot of risk, but it's things that are supposed to happen in low Earth orbit, and so it's not talking about like a system risk. It's talking about, okay, the astronauts are on their way. They're supposed to be launching on this day. We need to get the Lunar Starship up there. It needs to be refueled, like all of this dance that has to happen. But it's not like, all right, the astronauts are all the way at the moon, and then the dance has to happen. Oops, something didn't work the way we thought. Um, it's happening in low Earth orbit. Are the astronauts launched or not yet? The astronauts probably aren't even launched before you get a, a tanker up there or two, right? right? And so you, you have the opportunity to minimize yeah. some of the risk for the astronauts there, even though the system is very complicated, and I would argue likely to slip or likely to not work right the first time because we're doing things that we haven't done before. Get the Lunar Starship up there, launch a tanker, rendezvous with it. We can rendezvous. We know we can rendezvous. We do it all the time with the ISS. But uh, then yeah. get that tail-to-tail -tail refueling thing going and then pump the cryogenic propellants from one to the other, right? We haven't done anything like that before. Right. There have been very small-scale cryogenic fuel yeah. transfer things actually on the ISS, but on we're talking ISS, like right. we're talking like tanks that I could hold in my arms, yeah. not right. Starship. So uh, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. There's a little bit of experience there, but that's going to be... Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, but there's going to be a very big, a big deal yeah. once Starship makes its first orbital flight potentially later this year with a prototype vehicle. Um, as soon as they're doing that, one of the very first orbital flights, I'm sure, is going to start trying to demonstrate that on-orbit refueling capability because that's important not just for human landing system, but for pretty much any Starship architecture. You're talking about going to Mars. You're talking about the Dear Moon profile, which is to the moon but not landing. Even that requires at least one refueling. Um, and then if you're talking about going to higher Earth orbits and things like that, you may need some refueling there too. Um, interestingly, the source selection document talks about their concept of operations a little bit, and it actually sounds like they'll launch sort of one tanker starship to low Earth orbit, and then rendezvous with other tankers to refuel that one starship, get it fully fueled in low Earth orbit, and right. then launch the lunar starship, dock to it, transfer all the fuel, make sure, get, get yeah. yourself a fully refueled lunar starship, and then send that off to the moon to uh, dock with Orion, which is another good point because for the original missions, they were starting to hold out, or they were previously holding out that if Gateway's ready, we'll, we'll use the Gateway to do the crew handover. Um, yesterday, they made no mention of Gateway for these initial missions, so right. it sounds like Orion will dock directly to Starship, which was kind of expected. Gateway's sort of a long-term yeah. goal for more sustainable and more complex missions rather than the initial missions, so uh, no need for Gateway just yet. Um, Orion will dock, just like in this rendering, directly to Starship. Yeah. So it, it seems, I, I have to ask, like, did the other designs that didn't get selected, did they re require that same complexity of rendezvousing multiple times in low Earth orbit to put things together or reveal things? Or were those designs just like, launch and then go to the moon? Like, how did those compare? 
That's a very good point. And a lot of people point to Starship as this overly, this big, complex, very risky endeavor. Well, it's big. It, <laughs> it, well, I, no one will argue that it's not big. But to be fair, all the moon landings were big to it, a certain degree. Starship big. was the biggest. The biggest. <laughs> um, but uh, from my engineering perspective, I would actually argue that Starship was the simplest design of the three. The okay. other th- the other two from Dynetics and the national team, which was Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper, um, all of those required multiple launches just to assemble the vehicle. Um, Dynetics, I believe, required two launches because the second launch would bring the fuel tanks for them. Um, there was some refueling required for the Dynetics vehicle as well okay, because um, it would not launch fully fueled. And then the Blue Origin-led national team had three distinct components. You had an ascent element, which would get you from the lunar surface back to either Orion or Gateway. Uh, the descent element, which conducts the moon landing. And a transfer element, which rendezvoused from... which basically got it to a low lunar orbit before the final descent. Right. All three of those would have to launch separately. So that's three launches to assemble the lander there as well. And there could even be refueling com- uh, requirements there. Right. And those would all have utilized, uh, Dynex would have used ULA's Vulcan launch vehicle. The national team would have used either or or some combination of Vulcan and New Glenn. Right. So those are both also requiring uh, new launch vehicles, just like Starship is. So none of them had proven launch vehicles to build right. off of, which kind of hurt all of them. Yeah. Um, but the other ones requiring multiple launches just to assemble the vehicles, plus their own refueling requirements. Um, they had some pretty complicated concepts of operations as well. Yeah. So so it it sort of comes down to they all had to do this design where they're being assembled or refueled in orbit, Starship being refueled, the other ones being assembled and or refueled, right? Um, all of them were a little bit more complicated that way, and it comes down to what's more complicated, uh, docking things together and securing them so they can go or connecting them temporarily so that you can pump cryogenic fuels around. Right. Um, seems yeah. like a sort of muscle minnow, like which one of those is, is more dangerous, more risky, more likely to have issues that may push this, the schedule back, right? Um, but none of them were just like a one-shot thing. And personally, I sort of like that. I don't care if we go to the moon or not. I don't just want to go and like, hey, plant a flag, yay, it's 2024, congratulations, here we are. Um, I want something that we can go to the moon over and over and over, like a system that we can use to start going there on a regular basis, not a one-shot thing. So something that gives us experience with things like, more more experience with things like orbital construction of spacecraft, the ISS, yeah, we put it together, it doesn't really go beyond low th- low Earth orbit, right? So let's start assembling some other things up there. Refueling is huge for us. Like being able to bulk refuel large spacecraft is going to enable a lot of exploration between the moon and everywhere else, right? Yeah, so, it's like if you if you've played Kerbal or something, it's like taking your full vehicle and starting in orbit. You did the first you, people say getting to orbit is halfway to anywhere, right? Yep. If you're in low Earth orbit with full fuel tanks, you've skipped the first half of the journey, and yep. you've got all that performance to do whatever you want. So yeah, on orbit refueling is huge yep. for so many reasons. It really is. Um, it really is. So I I would not want NASA to just fund this thing and say, yay, we're on the moon, congratulations. I want them to fund something that here are pushing the boundaries of our technological capabilities so that we can do even more cool stuff, right? I think that that's a, that's a good thing for them to do as opposed to just Here's only $2 billion. Just plant a flag for us and then we're done. You know? Right. Um, but there's yeah. no way we're going to have to like extend this show to like six o'clock or something like that because we could talk <laughs> about this specifically for hours and hours. Let me read some more super chats real quick and then things that are relevant to the down select and stuff. I mean, there's still an entire section about what's going on at Boca Chica and stuff. Uh, I don't know if there's any chance we're going to get this done by uh, 4 30 Eastern. Um, let's see. Thomas Anfang, this one was from earlier, saying Michael is right. Starship is officially now an existential threat to the entire launch industry. I'm for one thrilled for what the future holds. Any comments on that? Starship is going to shut down the entire launch industry. It's no, all it's Starship not. all the time. It's not. That's false. Okay. <laughs> it's not okay. Why? Why, Thomas? So Starship is good. Will be good at a lot of different things. Um, but not only. Will it not do everything perfectly? There are some missions that will be better tailored to different uh, vehicles. And that's also, for the record, not what Michael said. Uh, right. Michael pointed <laughs> out that other launch providers had to look at competing with Starship. Right. But that doesn't mean that Starship is in, not yeah. able to be competed with. Com- right. Competed? Is competed? That's Com- the right word. Compete. Compete. <laughs> Compete with. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, I don't write the, articles. Now that, I mean, NASA has said yesterday, and I'm paraphrasing Michael here, NASA said 
that Starship and Super Heavy will work. They're right. paying SpaceX to make it work. But that doesn't mean that it will be the best at everything. Other launch providers and other companies will have different ways of doing things that may work better for different applications. Um, but it's he was right when he says it's time to start looking at how can we be competitive with Falcon 9. It's time to start looking at how can we com be competitive with Starship. What Starship. can we do that Starship doesn't? How can we do what Starship does better? Stuff like that. And for the commercial market specifically, that's the new conversation. Yeah. Or I, I'm yep. going to jump on that as well. It, it, or how can we use what Starship's going to enable? Right. right? So Starship all of a sudden yep. gives us this massive capability to low Earth orbit. What should we be designing that's not going to say, oh, well, I could also put that in low Earth orbit. It's like once you're in low Earth orbit, then we have this technology, whether it's some sort of habitation module or whether it's some sort of, you know, space tug that helps you move things around or assembles things. Like what other technologies are going to be needed once Starship is lugging 100 tons of whatever into low Earth orbit? Like that's another place that I think companies could start to look, you know? Absolutely. Tyler, Tyler, what about you? Um, you think uh, is it an existential threat or sort of the same lines we're talking here? Uh, it's sort of the same lines. And uh, it's also to go back to, you know, doing things in lower Earth orbit. Yeah, Starship has a huge payload capacity, around 100, 100 or 150 tons to LEO. But then you talk about higher orbits and then doing all the refueling and everything. And then you, uh, there are providers out there like ULA and uh, eventually New Glenn, which is uh, ULA and Blue Origin, which is coming up with Vulcan and New Glenn. Uh, and those have hydrogen fuel upper stages and they're high energy. So they can uh, deliver payloads to high orbits and even interplanetary destinations uh, more efficiently. And uh, after you know, looking at preliminary diagrams of, and C3 yep. and characteristic energy and all that stuff, uh, it seems like Starship suffers a little more in that area. So uh, it's good. It's very good for lower Earth orbit applications uh, at delivering payloads to LEO and uh, maybe even some higher orbits. But uh, if you want to go to interplanetary space or uh, to geostationary orbit or lunar orbit or beyond, uh, and you don't want to do all that uh, crazy refueling dance operations, uh, right. those uh, well, alternatives to Starship would be good. Oh no no! I was I was just gonna say um, of if New Horizons have... weighed a oh, hundred tons, <laughs> it probably could have gone a long way, right? So there's a lot of fuel that you could put on that sucker, because um, that's that's always the the yeah. counter argument to that. Like, exactly. why do you need to be efficient? We can just punch it until it's in orbit, and then we can punch right. it until it passes Pluto um, with this big massive payload of Starship, right? Um, right. But it's the same sort of things. Like there there are room for other. Yeah orbits there are room for other types of payloads starship and spacex as a whole still haven't demonstrated their accuracy on interplanetary trajectories or even their ability to do that um spacex hasn't sent anything to mars right uh, spacex is not not yet anyways they haven't sent anything to pluto they haven't sent anything anywhere, anywhere um except yeah. for low earth orbit and then some of those there was like one or two and then they tossed a car at the asteroid belt or something <laughs> like that right um so still there's a lot of opportunity and i i see <laughs> an operational starship not to shut down the rest of the industry, but maybe to enable the rest of the industry and help us push forward even further. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay. So we talked 10 minutes about one question. Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what does this mean for Dragon XL quickly? Is Dragon ah, XL still a yeah. thing? Oh, well, it can ride to orbit inside of a starship. <laughs> there oh. you go. So Dragon XL was supposed to be, or I shouldn't say was, is still <laughs> supposed to be a, a cargo spacecraft to resupply Gateway. Think Dragon re, resupplying the space yep. station, but doing it in, in lunar orbit. Um, that hasn't been canceled yep. or anything. However, since NASA seems to have acknowledged that Starship will be able to go to the moon and to the moon's surface before Gateway's ready, don't be surprised if that contract gets modified and Dragon XL gets replaced just with another variant of Starship. Or they just use right. cargo capacity on Lunar Starship or something like that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at that, but it, has, it hasn't happened yet. Um, yeah. But that's a good point to and point out something to look for. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then uh, it also came out, I think a few days ago, that right. they, uh, they haven't officially started the contract for Dragon XL development yet. 
I mean, they're still working some things and working some technical details, but they haven't officially activated the contract for uh, Dragon XL yet. Yeah. So Would it be hilarious if Dragon XL there. became like a module that could ride to the moon or wherever on Starship? Like, I've done this in Kerbal. It's like, oh, yeah, your payload section is actually a rotisserie of four different payload <laughs> modules, and these are all Dragon XLs, and they live up here, right? <laughs> and you just carry four <laughs> Dragon XLs to the moon in the cargo in the cargo bay of Lunar Starship or whatever. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's all sorts of opportunity, I think. So, good question. Rough Rider, thank you for the $20 there. I, I, we we got to get through more yeah. questions here. Um, Hunter asked do you guys think we could see we could still see the lunar starship plus orion rendezvous mission profile evolve into starship direct to the moon with crew aboard so that's interesting the reason you have orion is because it's the rv that takes you to the moon like that's what somebody told me when i was looking at a <laughs> mock-up of orion long ago it's like oh it's like a big rv instead of a little capsule thing right <laughs> um, that's basic built starship <laughs> well guess what you could fit it inside of the cargo area of starship <laughs> It's like an even bigger RV or, or like taking an entire hotel with you. Um, would they opt? Would, would we ever see an option <laughs> as part of this program or something doesn't work out where it's like, eh, just, just throw them in the starship and just let them ride the entire journey in the starship. Any options there? Down the road? Yes, but okay. just not initially. They need to crew rate the super heavy booster and feel oh, confident yeah. that they can put humans on a launch from Earth, which will come with a lot of uncrewed missions, including the Lunar Starship missions that, that are launching without crew on board. Um, through, once all of those prove that Starship is a very safe and able to be crew rated, um, a, evolution to use Starship the entire way and removing Orion and SLS from the equation is definitely possible. It's just that's a that's a future um, evolution, though. Right, because certainly with SpaceX, they have an option where they could either yeah. just launch crew on the starship and send them, or they could launch a lunar starship, fuel it up, et cetera, et cetera. And then why are you not launching a crew dragon up to rendezvous with it and then load crew onto the starship via crew dragon and then have starship go out to the moon, do its thing, come back, burn into low earth orbit again, and then rendezvous with the dragon again. And then dragon brings crew up and down. I mean, I could do all sorts all, of stuff with this if it was in Yeah, the, the, yeah. <laughs> in Kerbal, everything's easier in Kerbal. There's no fuel boil off in Kerbal, does? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly. well, there, there are mods that do that, right? I think you can mod exactly. do that. No, there are. There, there are definitely mods. <laughs> We've also <laughs> surpassed our quota for Kerbal references today. So. Oh, no yeah. such thing. <laughs> uh, let's <laughs> let's see here. Camper News Network, thanks for the Absolutely thirty-eight dollars. Saying thanks for all you do and looking forward to your crew two coverage Thursday morning. Planning on doing an all-nighter to watch Thursday morning. Thanks, Camper News. Us too. <laughs> yeah, it was so right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Paulus Plane says, seriously, <laughs> yeah, hit the like button quick. now. P.S. Have some more North Korean dollars. Love from Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paulus, for the support. Um, let's see here. Daniel Jones <laughs> is a new member. We've got... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Pampa Lax says Hopper is the only flight proven starship available. <laughs> the only well, one that lived. <laughs> not you are in... technically correct. I mean, the best kind of correct. Technically not best wrong. kind of correct. Nice. Uh, let's see here. Just trying to get through a lot of these. I know we've been doing a ton of talking here. Uh, Left Guard Viz says, great viewing as always. Nose cone in that render with Orion looks like the nose cone in the test rig. Did SpaceX know that long ago that they were going to get it? So that's well, interesting. They, they would have started development before they were actually won the competition. They right. had to prove to NASA that they could do it in order to get the award. Yeah. So they've likely been, they've been working on that yeah. sort of setup for a while. Right. Uh, no idea. I, is there? There's. We can bring up a picture of that testing structure. It's in our, yeah. our document there, Doss. Ah, I think we do have that, don't we? No, it's going testing structure. There it is. Thank yep, you. Yep. There you go. So. Um, to give everyone a context, then back to the normal NSF live content of showing pictures from Boca Chica via Mary. <laughs> um, this is that the sort of structural test <laughs> article that they've been using. Yeah, it's a weird right. looking nose cone thing. Um, we can't definitively say if that has anything to do with like docking port testing or if that's just testing the loads on a nose cone. Um, although right. it does happen to be right next to their lunar mock up scenario just to the right of it there. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
if that is relevant to human landing system development, um, it's not because they knew they were going to win already. Um, the doc, the source selection document says they went into pricing negotiations on April 2nd. Um, so they think they've had a good idea for about two weeks that they were going to win. It just didn't become official until yesterday. Right. Um, but uh, this was even before that. Yeah. So we believe this was like, this could be completely separate from human landing system. And even if, if it wasn't separate, if it was part of it, um, they were working on that in anticipation of potentially winning, not because they knew they were going to win. I hope that right. makes sense. Yeah, you, you got to sort of sort of keep doing it. That that sort of brings up something yeah. that I've wanted to say here. Um, I don't get the impression that Starship was dependent on winning this contract or not. Starship was good as Starship, with or without this contract. <laughs> Anybody want to disagree with that? Like, I, I think Starship was going to go and do its thing. Yeah. Right? T Tyler, you want first dibs on that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that hanger name. <laughs> um, no, I could see. I could see. I can agree with that assessment. Uh, because SpaceX would have planned on landing Starships on the moon anyway. And, of course, uh, using the flaps and things like that to enable return from uh lunar orbit and beyond or uh, scratch that but um in terms of what nasa wanted uh for hls specifically they right it feel it feels like it had to happen eventually the version that nasa wanted to use that with those uh, high gas thrusters and uh solar panels and all those other capabilities, uh, Starship wouldn't necessarily have that for uh, just solo uh, lunar missions, uh, either to lunar orbit or to land and then come back. So it feels like, yeah, it feels like to me that uh, for this version specifically, they had to win this award. But uh, if they didn't, then they probably would have gone anyway regardless. Of course, they have to create the standard version of Starship, I guess you could call it, uh, to yeah. do those kinds of missions. I mean, but uh, yeah. Like, Dear think, Moon wasn't landing, but Dear Moon was going out it. around the moon anyways, right? Regardless of whether HLS, human landing system, is the difference there, right? Yeah. Um, was a thing or not. Thomas, what do you think? Like, was Starship just going to do its thing, yeah. no matter what NASA wanted? Das knows my answer, so he's setting me up here. I'm um, setting you up. <laughs> good. I'm giving so, you no, no, no. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give my answer. Uh, <laughs> Starship, you're right that you know Starship wasn't going anywhere with if they, if they didn't win this contract, yeah. SpaceX wasn't about to cancel Starship, right? Right. But the point of Starship is to get people to Mars. The Moon is a goal yeah. that SpaceX is happy to support when a customer asks for it. But their base is setting up a, a base, sorry for the bad wording there, on Mars, though, um, which does not require this variant of Starship that NASA wants. NASA wants a version that is tailored towards landing people and cargo on the surface of the moon. Right. Um, so when NASA awards this contract, they are ensuring that there is a variant of Starship designed for lunar surface missions which SpaceX is under no obligation to do without this contract. Um, that's, or SpaceX could have very easily said, all right, no, we don't have any customers that want to buy a mission to the lunar surface, so we're not going. Right. Um, that's very likely what would have happened if they had not won this contract. So you're correct that Starship is not dependent on the HLS contract, but lunar Starship and Starship missions to the lunar surface are. Dear Moon is not a service yeah. mission and can use more or less a more standard aerodynamic surface equipped starship variant um versus one that will uh, land on the surface of the moon and you can remove the aero surfaces because it's never going to land on earth either it's going to go right. between the surface and orbit um that's a very different variant and spacex is happy to build it when a customer pays for it um and that is what's happened with this contract award yeah nasa yeah. is the customer paying for that specific version of the more efficient starship designed to be in orbit and stay in orbit as right. opposed and, to carry a bunch of junk up and down that it doesn't need, has nothing to do with the moons. Nobody cares about the aerodynamic right. surfaces. But if all you're supposed to do is go up and down from the moon to moon orbit, maybe come back to Earth orbit, maybe go back to the moon again, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that's sort of what they're making for the HLS contract, right? Right. And the other thing exactly. to, to consider is you've got like the, the landing engines on the Lunar Starship mm -hmm. are only used on the moon. So those likely would have gone away. 
Um, the elevator they probably need on Mars eventually, so they probably still use that. Yeah. Um, but also, this idea of creating a new variant of Starship still fits into SpaceX's sort of overall plan for Starship. They were already going to have half a dozen variants of Starship. You're going to want a satellite launching variant with a payload bay. Right. Um, you're going to want a crew rated version for crew and or cargo rated variants, so potentially two for space station surfacing, because that is a uh, something else that they are pitching Starship right. for, basically to take the place of Dragon for the International Space Station. Again, that's a variant they'll only develop if a customer asks for it, but that's a potential variant. Right. And then you have, I guess, what we can call the Dear Moon variant, which may not be any significantly different from a low Earth orbit crewed Starship. Right. Um, yeah. Some crew variant that can conduct a Dear Moon mission. You're now adding a human landing system variant for lunar surface missions, you have a tanker variant and potentially a lunar depot or a fuel depot variant, which might be slightly different to store fuel versus bringing fuel to orbit and back. And then you have a Mars landing variant, which will likely be two, a, a crew variant and a cargo variant. So I just read it off like eight different variants that SpaceX <laughs> could develop. So yeah. all of these will obviously have a lot of coming out. They're all going to be used the same stainless steel tank sections. They're all going to use the Raptor engines. The crew cabins on the crew variants will all likely be pretty much the same. The elevator that works on the moon will likely just work the same on Mars. Right. There's a lot of coming out. If they yeah. get around to putting legs on everything, the legs will all probably be the same. <laughs> so the RCS thrusters are the same, but they'll tweak minor things about, do you put the moon landing thrusters on it? Do you have the crew compartment or is it a payload bay? Those kind of minor changes between the different variants still keep everything with a lot of commonality, but allow you to have different variants for different missions, which helps Starship accomplish something that's things like the space shuttle couldn't. All the space shuttle orbiters were basically identical. So they all right. had basically the same you know, capabilities. Yeah. Whereas if you take a Starship vehicle, which is more like a family of vehicles, and have minor differences. They all come off the same production line, but they have slightly different capabilities for all the different missions that Starship could support. I was thinking about this the other day. It's kind of like all the cars that come off a of production line are the same car, but they're not identical. They have different options. You could have the sun, the sunroof and the GPS navigation and stuff, which isn't in every single one that comes off the production line, but right. that gives it different capabilities. Think of Starship in that way. There's going to be a Starship production facility in Boca Chica and uh, likely one in Florida too that'll pump out a bunch of Starships which have different options and capabilities for whatever missions they're going to be used for. Yeah, yeah. I, I would be remiss if I didn't roll a Mary video. So instead of just sitting yeah, we're just gonna do that really on, quick. Just rolling Mary videos too here. Um, you can't have an NSF live unless you show some of the daily videos that come through the channel every Absolutely single day. So not. we'll roll this in the background here while we continue to talk. Um, let me keep grabbing some more questions here because yeah. we want to get some non super chat questions. Let right. me see if there's any super chats that are not questions. Uh, let's see here. This is more of a comment. Max says that NASA being sensible, getting ahead of the game. So once SLS contracts are out, they will have their next vehicle ready and have influence in its build. So talking about choosing Starship for SLS or for SLS. <laughs> they're, they're, the, the right. Starship launch system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Choosing Starship for yeah. HLS um, also means that another heavy lift vehicle is going to need to be developed because Lunar Starship doesn't happen. Super heavy lift. The booster this, works. this is super heavy lift class, I would argue. I, I'm, 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 this yeah, is completely arbitrary. You. I'm yeah. saying if it's over 100 tons to lower, yeah. that's super heavy lift okay. class. I made that up, but it's rule now. Sounds anyway, good continue. to me. I'll, I'll yeah. go with it. I'll go with it. Um, <laughs> but, but it's not just funding this one Lunar Starship. It's also, in order to get that money, they are also going to have to build this other big rocket that could be used for other things, right? That they're already building. Um, right. I like it, Max. Let's see here. Miroslav, thank you so much for the Euros. We appreciate you. <laughs> Renzo26 says, Hopper to the moon. Thanks for all the great <laughs> coverage. Excellent. And uh, let's see. Hey, if you here. want to guarantee that the first moon landing is successful, send Hopper because you know Hopper can't die. So <laughs> it would hit and tumble. And then, like, when the exactly. yeah, it would create a crater, crater, but it would be completely fine. It would still be yeah. there, like, right side up. <laughs> or it would be leaning over, and then it yeah. would somehow ride itself, like, in Kerbal. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Quick question yeah. Will the legs get left behind like they did during Apollo? Who wants that one? Ah. Starship? Yeah, go for it. I mean, I can take that one. So, um, of course, the Apollo lunar, uh, the Apollo lunar module had two elements. It had the descent element and the ascent element. And of course, uh, after all the activities were done on the surface, and the astronauts wanted to get back into 
uh, lunar orbit to rendezvous with the command module, uh, the ascent element would detach from the descent element, and still uh, that would be left behind on the surface. With uh, lunar starship, that doesn't happen. You can send the whole vehicle down, and you can send it back up. No components are left behind aside from the uh, cargo and the flag that you right. leave on the on the surface. So it's a good uh, good part of the reusability aspect. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting because it's sort of the balance between reusability and efficiency. When you mm -hmm. don't want to leave anything behind, you've got to carry it all with you, which yeah. can be engineering perspective inefficient. You've got to carry landing legs, but you don't need those landing legs anymore. Well. If you want to reuse it and you want to land again, you got to take the legs with you, right? Unless you're going to dock a new leg module every time you need to land. So, yes, you're toting around yeah. things that that normally would have been left behind because that was the efficient way to do it. The lunar module didn't bring the legs with it on the way back up because it didn't need the legs again. It wasn't going to be reused. Um, where a starship, it needs to carry everything with it and not leave anything behind or else it sort of fails at some of its reusability goals, right? Except for the propellant. The propellant's the only thing it leaves behind. Um, yeah, sure. And the other quick yeah. points to make on that, well, I was telling you earlier about how I think <laughs> Starship is actually the simplest Correct. of the three proposed human landing systems. It's bec partly because there's no staging event, right? It separates from Super Heavy during the initial launch, and that's it. There's no leaving a descent element on the moon. There's no transfer element aspect. It's all built into one. Um, and that also aids that reusability goal, which NASA also values because NASA was looking for designs that yeah. are either initially or can be evolved to be fully reusable. And right. Starship is actually the only one of the three that was 100% reusable in at least eventually. Right. Even Dynetics and Blue Origin said, oh, well, we can reuse parts of it, um, but we don't really have a way to reuse our transfer element or we don't really have a way to reuse our drop tanks if you're talking about Dynetics. Right. Um, so even those could have become partially reusable, but not fully reusable. So that is another thing yeah. that kind of pulled it towards uh, SpaceX's Starship design. Yeah. And it, along the same lines, um, also something that could be used as a commercial yep. option for other people, not just NASA. That's something yes. that's specifically said in the selection document. Yep. They liked it because there was a clear plan. Yeah not for only NASA to buy this, but for other people to other companies to be able to buy rides on this, right? Yes. And it's sort of NASA paying SpaceX to develop this system that then yeah. also enables other organizations to get into space, which is an interesting thing. Like if you think it, it's like, why should the US taxpayers pay for a private company to be able to open up opportunities for other people to buy rides on this thing that the US taxpayers paid for? Well, do you want to go into space or not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? It's, it's 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 the it's the reason that we have things that are yeah. funded by government programs like that. Sometimes it might not make sense, but it, it increases humanity's capacity. We're recycling things better. We're increasing technology, like whatever. The government is supposed to fund stuff like that to make life better. And if they are helping SpaceX design a system that's going to allow humanity to expand into low Earth orbit and the moon and to Mars and to wherever. Um, does that really help everyone? It's not even just helping, you know, United States citizens. Is that helping all of humanity? Right. And the, so. the other, and the other point to that being, if this, if Lunar Starship right. was being developed for only NASA, it would be more expensive for a bit, and SpaceX would have been much more hesitant to give the price tag that they did. The Part of the reason that Starship is cheaper is because there's a lot of development work that's already been done anyway. But the other part of it is SpaceX knows if they invest some of their resources into developing it, they will get return on that investment because they know there are other customers coming. Right. The Blue Origin and Dynetics teams were very much tailored towards, we want to operate this for NASA. Blue Origin's yeah. descent element was based on Blue Moon, which was supposed to be a commercial system. But Blue Origin chose right. to only take part of that design and combine it with other elements that were specific to Artemis, which was why the, the national team system wasn't really a fully commercial thing. Yeah. If Blue Origin had bid on their own, their own complete vertically integrated lander, I'm willing to bet that it would have been less expensive. Um, but that's not the decision right. that they went with. Right. I wonder if they'll come back with a different option yeah. for another phase of something. I, I don't another... get the Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know what point I want to bring yeah. to. This is kind I know, of I know. the other big point <laughs> yeah. that I want to make sure we talk about. So the, the original contract <laughs> that SpaceX has been awarded is for the uncrewed demonstration and a crewed demonstration, which obviously sets them up for future missions as well. However, they, those right. have not been awarded yet. They said as soon as this coming week, NASA is going to start fast tracking a program for, I think, I forget what they call it, like lunar landing services program. So think commercial resupply services or commercial crew services. 
we're talking right. about that's kind of same yeah. scenario but to the moon to the moon um and so they're going to be able to on ramp other companies with come up with new designs or new proposals they'll likely have to go through some sort of demonstration ahead of time just like spacex will and they'll be behind sure. spacex as far as schedule and development timelines go however they're going to want to on ramp more providers because nasa wanted to select at least two actually they could only select up to they wanted to select two for this initial award and didn't have the resources to do so. So they picked Starship to be initial to yeah. be the initial capability and they're going to say, okay, we need to create a new program for recurring landing services, of which Starship will likely remain a part of, but they will the competition will be for Starship and any other companies that want to solicit proposals and uh, so they can set up a more operational capacity. And they're gonna go right. to Congress and say, This is what happened with the budget you gave us. Give us a better budget so we yep. can do it better after the original missions. Yeah. Um, so that's another yep. key point to make. Starship will not be the only lander. It's just the one yep. that they're starting with. It's like, just give us a nuclear submarine budget or something like that. Come on. <laughs> Stuff's not that well, expensive. And honestly, compared to other things that we spend money on, <laughs> exactly. it's not that expensive. You could double it. And it's like, oh, do we need another aircraft carrier or do we want to be on the moon? You know, do we need 15 more cruise missiles or do we want to be on the moon? Like, it's not... In the it's frustrating from, budget. from our points of view for that kind of thing. Yeah. And I, you know, risking getting into the, the, yeah. the heavy politics stuff. But I know. I think if I think if you know what we do for a living, we all know our our thoughts on that kind of thing for the most part. Yeah. I, let me grab some more questions here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know that it's four thirty. How are y'all? We started a couple minutes late. Can we keep talking about this? Do y'all have I've like, got some lunch time? Out? You got some time? How about you, Tyler? All right. Cool. All right, so we'll do another two hours. If anyone show. doesn't yeah, have time, we'll kick you off and keep talking with everyone. Yeah, we'll just kick you off. We'll put. I'll draw a picture Eventually, of you in your spot. In five hours, Doss will be here on his own, <laughs> still talking and answering questions. Yeah. It's just, it's one of those topics where there's there's so much about it, and we could talk about it forever. Yeah, right. Um, let me see. And it's not like we prepared a presentation to talk you through either. We're just talking about stuff, you know. Uh, let's see here. Sep Sepice Banana says, any thoughts on SpaceX using suborbital starships for tourist launches like Blue Origin from the suborbital launch pads? I have not heard suborbital tourism starships. Have y'all? Well, Earth to Earth is basically uh, okay. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So here's the because part of the market for Earth to Earth will be I, mean, I need to that. commute to Tokyo right. in 40 minutes. Right. Part of, the, yeah. part, part of the market will be I want to ride on a starship. <laughs> and so true. i'm gonna buy a, i'm gonna buy a round trip ticket and take two flights on starship and that will be you know yeah some some of the routes will need super heavy some of them won't depends yeah. on the distance so, um but uh i mean if they're gonna go to earth to earth i think de facto yeah. some of that will be a tourism thing at least initially maybe it becomes more of a like because no one really buys airline tickets for tourism at least i don't think not, not true well uh, <laughs> no, no, I was going to tell you uh, when the Dreamliner came out, I literally purchased a <laughs> ticket to Chicago just to be I didn't care about Okay, I don't play. I, 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 okay. The, Come on, normal people do I, this, I, right? I, I, oh, well, no, I'm, I'm in that market too and totally would. Um, but I think we're. I think that's a very niche market. Well, I guess so, so is space, space tourism. On the so stream. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler, have, would you buy a ticket on a plane just to ride on that plane? <laughs> Our sample size is 100% I mean, of our sample I size. I wouldn't say no, necessarily. Right, anyway, it's a lot of statistics yeah. analysis right now. We, we are not a representative sample. <laughs> so, Tyler, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but technically, yeah, Earth to Earth does cover both of those, or tailored, tailored to both of those sects of people that are like, like, I want to fly on Starship, yeah. but at the same time, I want to go yeah. places. You know? Also, you don't care Dreamliner if you stay day, alive I or not, totally but, you know. But... <laughs> Anyways. Um, let me keep it some more. Uh, that is a great <laughs> point about suborbital tourism and point-to-point -point also maybe being a, a joyride tourist sort of thing. Um, I could completely get behind that. Um, oh, I've got this one set up here. We, we've been set up, and we were going to do it at the end of the show. Uh, we're going to be spending a little bit more time in the show. But this, on Twitter the other day, we got a fantastic tweet from a viewer who drew a picture for Mary. And this super chat, you didn't have to do a super chat. I had it in the queue over here um, saying, hey, NASA Space Flight, can you show my drawing of Starship? It would make my day. Oh, I'm hard to, sorry to hear your dog passed away yesterday. Um, we have the photo of it from Matt Croc. Sorry to hear about your puppy, uh, but we did have your picture here that we could bring up on the screen. Yeah. So this was actually submitted by a viewer. 
it says Time Magazine at the top. Nice. I didn't see that originally. <laughs> nice. And uh, it's got a picture of a starship on it and says, is there life on Mars? SpaceX, That's the race cool. to Mars. So absolutely positively, thank you for sending that to us. It was a tweet um, that was sent. And Chris G., the official account at NASA Spaceflight, was copied on that. I We've talked a few times about doing like a viewer mailbag or something like that, right? Yeah. Where somebody sends us mail. And honestly, this is a fantastic way yeah. to do this. This would be a great inaugural viewer mailbag. This picture yeah. that uh, was given to, was tweeted out for said, make sure Mary gets it. <laughs> and we wanted to make sure we showed that on the show today. So uh, Matt, thank you so much for, for sending that out. Sorry about the dog. That's tough. Um, thank you for sending us the photo or the, the picture and the, the photo of the picture you drew. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Matt. That was very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I don't I don't have yeah, my wallet okay. with me, but uh, in my wallet, I carry around a drawing that uh, the, the kid of a of a viewer gave to me at like a con, like at a convention PAX. And somebody walked up to me and said, hey, Das, you know, we watch your Kerbal shows. We drew this picture and they handed me this this crayon hand drawn drawing. I'll have to tweet out a photo of it. And I still have that drawing in my wallet. Um, things like that really do mean a lot to us, just to showing that we're able to help share this experiment with people of all ages or, or experience with people of all ages. So this is a really cool photo. Good job on the drawing. I like the number of windows. It's very fashionable. Yes. Say. <laughs> so let's see here. I'll just I'll leave it up on the screen for a minute. Why not? Um, more questions. Why are we talking about landers? We were talking about landers because of that HLS, the Human Landing System Award, where SpaceX was chosen as the recipient, the winner of the Human Landing System, getting over $2 billion for uh, landing, getting a vehicle to land on the moon. Did I get that right, Thomas? Yeah. Well, did you read the last rest of the Super Chat? <laughs> Just jump at the oh, <laughs> it was it was a joke, Doss. <laughs> I thought that the way I read it, I thought they were just jumping into the stream at the last second and they didn't understand oh. why we were talking about landers. So I was explaining why we were talking about landers. It's not an elevator, jeez, just jump at the last second. <laughs> Moving right along, <laughs> um, BJ. Turan says Lunar Starship could be the real version of the Pan Am Ares 1B from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Film was off by 30 years. Lol. There you go. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I like the wings <laughs> on that SSTO they had, though. Those were oh, good wings God. on that SSTO. <laughs> Going up to that yeah, nice If station. you hang out with DOS at all, any anytime someone brings up human rating Starship, he just goes, it doesn't have wings. I'm not getting on it. wings. If an engine fails, you're screwed. I'm not getting on it. I'm not getting not on it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, if they need it live streamed from like inside, I mean, maybe I would. That maybe that would convince him. <laughs> maybe after yeah. a couple uncrewed flights. <laughs> yeah, and you know, landing one without exploding. Let's see here. Uh, hey, Chris Good Moore, time. thank you for the support as well. Talking about comparing SLS to various uh, various lunar starship or various starship modules. Um, let's grab some other questions. Here's we haven't talked about this yet. Let's get this one from Words and in Ink. NASA Spaceflight didn't Blue Origin's proposal disqualify themselves because they wanted funding up front. Kind of. Who wants yeah. to talk about that weird kind of, yeah. comment that was in there? Yeah. So basically, yeah. there were rules about um, how much funding could come at the time of the award. So yesterday. Um, right. And as part of everyone's proposal, the company lays out when certain amounts of their price need to be delivered by, um, which we kind of talked about earlier, how SpaceX actually changed some of that to make sure that NASA could afford the bid. Um, right. Blue Origins bid asked for, I believe, two awards very early on that actually broke the rules of the um, program and technically disqualified them from being awarded anything. Now, could they, if they yeah. really needed that award to happen, could they have gone to Blue Origin and said, look, we want to select your lander, but you you broke the rules here. We need to modify your payment schedule to make sure it complies. They could have likely done that, um, but the way it was proposed actually broke the rules and disqualified them. Correct. Uh, what's the exact wording here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Render blue Something origin like proposal ineligible for award without the government engaging right. in discussions or negotiations. Like I said. So. So. Yeah. And of course, you go back to that oh, whole no, no, thing no. about. Keep talking. Oh, sorry. Keep Dust. talking. Didn't mean to step on you. Okay, so uh, going back to 
NASA not even having enough to um, do a single uh, contract award for HLS. Uh, it was noted that there was a comment in there about how uh, we didn't even have enough funding to let board and know that they could go back and revise yeah, their proposal. It was about good faith. It was so, even if we were. Uh, yeah. I mean, technic- yeah, technically, the, the, yeah. I, I don't know where it was here, but it, it said they couldn't yeah, exactly. reapproach Blue Origin in, in good faith because even if Blue Blue Faith Blue Origin <laughs> changed the proposal to uh, to follow that letter of their requirements <laughs> about prepaid performance things, kickoff meeting payments, and that sort of stuff. Even if they revised it, they still didn't have enough money to award two proposals, yeah, right. right? So yeah, so, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I, I found it interesting. They were talking about payments right. related to kickoff meetings. Like literally, what it says here is kickoff meeting related payments are counter to the solicitation's instructions. Um, it wasn't performance like like you are delivering something and then the payment comes in because you've delivered this thing. It's oh, we're having a kickoff meeting and we need money to do it. And that was apparently part. That's the way I read it. That was part right, yeah, of exactly. something that proposal said you can't do this. Yeah, um, you got to deliver stuff to get your next payment. It's right. not get paid to have a meeting. So right. um, that's what that was talking about there. And the whole thing was, even right. if they gave Blue Origin an opportunity to correct that, they didn't have the budget to award two winners. So in good faith, they couldn't even, they didn't want to waste Blue Origin's time, basically. Um, it's worth noting that based on, in this document, I don't know if you can scroll a bit, you know that table yeah. that just shows the ratings for the three um, things? I think it's very early on. I can scroll. Um, Jeez, where is it? it, it they, are. I, I, well... Yeah. Keep go- keep going down a bit. The yeah, strings uh, or the uh, outstandings. It's one that's it's it's got a row for SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Dynetics. So keep going down a bit. It's a it's a small one. Oh, this one. That there one. You go. Yeah. So if you actually look at yeah, this, and you, basically, obviously, these are there's like, they go into a lot more detail later in the document, but this is right. just a one or two word summary of the two kind of things they look at: the technical readiness of the actual design, and then the way that the company is managing their program. Um, you can see that uh, SpaceX has the Tied for the highest rating in technical and the highest in management. So, from if they had the if funding wasn't a problem and they were going to be able to select two, SpaceX still would have been their number one choice. However, their number two choice would have been Blue Origin because they had a higher technical rating than Dynetics did. So, just another thing to point out: um, should should the funding not have been a problem, that's where those other uh, proposals yeah. stood. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting here. It basically says you know technical rating factor one is yeah. does your design have a chance of working. Right. right. Like, like, what are all the little bits and bobs? Like, technically, how would this work? Um, and then the management right. rating is how good your PowerPoint presentations are, right? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> and it's so clearly a lot more than that. Um, but those are the two different things. <laughs> exactly. like the, the technical merits of the design um, from a mission architecture perspective, from a design perspective, from a components and sourcing perspective. Like, where are you getting this stuff? How's it being made? Does it exist or not yet? And then the management rating is how, how do you go about tracking these projects how do you go about right. making sure things you have like room for slips in the schedule and, and that sort of stuff. i don't even know exactly how to explain that in a nutshell i don't think you can because it's a complex thing how do yeah. you make a big complicated program like this make sure it gets from point a to point b you know also right. can someone check did tyler get the exact number right because it's on oh, screen geez. right now someone go <laughs> back and check is that what tyler said earlier <laughs> 2.9 billion dollars um <laughs> I think, like I said, I think I got point nine billion close, is what I'm gonna go. With, been so. You know, it's something like four twenty squared times sixty nine think... squared or something like that. You know yeah. that there's yeah, some you know this number is something like that. Elon. I'm on to you. I haven't <laughs> cracked the code yet, but I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's see if we can get some more questions here. We're fifteen minutes past when we're supposed to stop, uh, but so many good questions. Here is an interesting thing. So after the two demo flights to the moon, will the Starship be deselected? I don't think that's the plan at all. I think that they do two demo flights and then they can be awarded this commercial contract, like the lunar resupply commercial contractor, the lunar boot elevator trampoline, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> contract. Like, like there are other contracts that providers can compete for after yeah. the demos or even right up to the time the demos are happening in SpaceX right. is going to have a massive leg up. Yeah. So, right. right. So it's not guaranteed that SpaceX gets awarded missions after yeah. that, but it would have kind of been similar to canceling crew dragon after demo two. That would seem kind of silly. Um, right. Th- so, so 
the anticipation is that SpaceX will be awarded future yeah. missions after the demo missions, likely building on things they've learned during the demo missions. But um, it's not guaranteed technically. Um, but it is more likely that Starship will continue to operate afterwards, in addition to on ramping other providers. Um, at least, yeah. well, the likely one, at least two. Uh, that that's what SpaceX we would, would, that would to, be expected. Yeah, they'd have to really screw something up yeah. in order to not be competitive yeah. for future regular commercial visits to the moon. Like right. they're never able to actually land on the moon or something super serious that I don't think anybody would envision right. happening. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just, we'll, we'll try to speed run some of these questions right. here. Um, we've talked about this one. Ed Duncan was saying, do you think they'll select national teams or dynetics later? So there'd be two landers like the commercial crew program. Um, Thomas, you talked about that some where yeah. they're going to fast track this other program that will be more missions to the moon and other companies could submit proposals for those contracts. Um, it might not I be hope. Dynetics and National Team. It will. It could be some very different designs from similar companies, um, but th they will on ramp some. They will want to on ramp other landers. Yes. Yeah, I, I y'all know I'm a big proponent. We never want to put all of our eggs in one basket, and we don't want only Elon Musk able to get us to the surface of the moon. Right. We want options to get to the ISS. We want options for crew. We want options right. to get to the moon. We want options to get on the surface of the moon. We want options to launch. Like we want options for all these things. We never want all of our eggs in one basket, regardless of how good the deal looks, right? right. Like we always want to have options. So I, I hope that NASA has right. some sort of plan to be like, hey, Congress, wow, y'all are pretty mad, huh? We need more money. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can have some of your friends here too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's yeah. sort of out there what I just said, but I wonder if they're not going to turn back around and say, if you want more options and you want to keep these options open and you want to have multiple commercial companies able to provide these services, we got to be able to pay for it. And that's on you. Right. right? No, you're exactly right. Yeah. So I, I do right. imagine that NASA has something that they're thinking of that will give us multiple options to get to the moon and another company to be able to bid for services like that. We'll, the we'll folks see. at NASA are not stupid. <laughs> they not know dumb. exactly yeah. what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Just So there's a ton of questions, and we actually answered most of these questions just over the course of our discussion. So if we didn't specifically read out your question here, it may be because we actually answered it before I even saw the question. Let me see if there's anything. Ah, this is interesting. I like this. I hadn't thought of this before. Rick was asking, would a starship on the moon or its shadow be visible from Earth and deter future hoax or conspiracies? Is starship mm. big enough to cast a shadow you could see with the telescope from the ground on Earth? No, right? I don't know the answer. I highly doubt it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. No, I mean, Starship yeah. is. Well, you will yeah. be I able. Mean, to... Is pretty big. Oh, go ahead. But, uh, it would take. Yeah, it would take a lot to cast a shadow big enough to see at least with looking ground, through the atmosphere, like ground-based telescopes like what you buy. Yeah, if you point Hubble at the uh, moon, sure, you can probably see Starship, online. but yeah. I don't think that's what they're going to do. What you will yeah. be able to yeah. see is the <laughs> lights of the lunar base on the dark side. <laughs> That starship helps build, but other <laughs> but you won't be able to see individual starships. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. I almost want to reach out to like a telescope expert and say, yeah. hey, the most powerful ground based telescopes we have. What's the resolution that they can see on the surface of the moon? Could we see you know starship fifty meters tall, sun just rising, going to cast this long shadow? The shadow would be calculated to be this long and this wide. Could your telescopes resolve that? Um, I almost want to reach out to like a telescope expert and ask. I don't. I don't know. It, it sounds like we don't think that that's the case, but that's a good question. I hadn't thought of it. It's like we'll have to get back to you yeah. on that one. Um, what about crew rating Falcon Heavy as backup? Yeah. Why would that not help us? Crew rating a Falcon Heavy as a backup. So Falcon Heavy does not have the performance to launch Orion to lunar orbit. Um, NASA looked at that explicitly, especially with some SLS delays. They looked at other alternate launch vehicles for the Orion spacecraft, um, and Falcon Heavy cannot do it. It's just—it's a very powerful rocket, but it's not as powerful yep. as SLS. 
Is it um, a is it a mass thing or is it a volume thing with the diameter of Orion versus the diameter the, of the diameter makes things slightly complicated. You would need some sort of adapter on the upper stage, but from a pure mass to orbit perspective, Falcon Heavy can't do it, even fully expendable. Okay. Um so that's problem number one. And then problem number two is well, okay, if yeah. we can't do Orion, use Crew Dragon, which we know interfaces with Falcon 9. Falcon Heavy could certainly launch it. Right. In fact, SpaceX at one point planned to launch a variant of Crew Dragon to lunar orbit on Falcon Heavy before yeah. it got transferred to Starship and became Dear Moon. Right. Um, so we know that's feasible. However, uh, that would require heavy modifications to the Crew Dragon yep. design. Crew Dragon is a low Earth orbit vehicle. Yep. It doesn't have the propellant capacity or the radiation shielding for a moon mission. Um, and so that's not really an option either. So and even like duration uh, and supplies and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it's not designed for that. I, I think yeah. if you ever saw a hybrid, right? I think the most likely thing you would see is Starship launching, tanking up, ready to go in low Earth orbit, and then Crew Dragon, just regular old Crew Dragon on a regular Falcon 9. You don't need heavy for that. Launching right. crew members, because remember, that can go up to seven people. Um, maybe doing one or two or three launches right. of Crew Dragons and then stocking up the Starship with meat bags and then sending them the rest of the way to the moon. That's, if I had That's to more. Guess, that is the most feasible yeah. sort of replacement. But, the, but then you're eating into fuel boil-off margins for sitting yeah. in low Earth orbit instead of going to the moon immediately after refueling. Right. Um, and then... Um, Crew, crew duration is a little longer yeah. because you have to loiter in low Earth orbit for a bit before going to the moon. Yep. Um, so that there's a little bit of added complication there. And plus, you that pretty much negates lunar gateway capabilities at all. So if you're trying to get crew to lunar orbit to do gateway operations or experiments on that platform, that doesn't help you. Right. Um, so, so there are some other complications there, but you're right. That's more feasible. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Real quick, let's get this one. Uh, do you think that the other teams from HLS, Blue Origin National Team, Dynetics, will continue to go to the moon on their own? Or might the programs be completely donezo because they didn't get the contract here? Blue Origin might with their Blue Moon Lander, which was part of the national team proposal, but I don't right. see the other companies mm -hmm. doing commercial operations, yeah. no. Just to tell somebody, tell somebody, tell Jeff Bezos that somebody needs an Amazon package on the moon, and <laughs> it'll probably get done. Um, which I, I joked, right? That's sort of yeah. a joking way to say it. But the new contract for lunar surface repeat commercial supply or humans or whatever is basically putting Amazon boxes on the moon. You could look at it that way, right? Yep. So maybe so, maybe so. Yeah. Um, now, is Jeff Bezos just going to land on the moon because he wants to land on the moon? We haven't really seen him make any comments to that effect, right? I don't. Right. Not yet. They, yeah. they should. Uh, they've got. They've got some suborbital human spaceflight to do first. I think. Yeah. Not yet. Um. And let me see here. Just two more super yeah. chats. Let's. Should we target uh, about seven more minutes here, y'all? We're thirty minutes over, but it's such a cool topic with to me, talk yeah. about. We can sort of greenfield it all day. Let's see if we can get to five o'clock Eastern. Here. All right, cool. Yeah, um, that's fine. I wait until it's six minutes now until that to even ask you. <laughs> no, uh, Doss, I have to leave right now. Okay, see. You okay, again. hi Thomas. I'm gonna draw a picture of Thomas. <laughs> Replace him over there. Yeah. Uh, John Ferris was asking if HLS never lands yeah. back on Earth, what use will it be once it's delivered its cargo to the moon? How can you reload it? So. This is a good question. Is SpaceX using the same starship for both landings? Or is it two different Ooh. lunar starships? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, okay, I mean... so when so to answer the base question, <laughs> it is. Starship can be refueled, which means either sending a tanker to lunar orbit to refuel there or sending moon, uh, the lunar starship back to low Earth orbit and refueling there either way. Right. Um, that's how you reload the fuel. And then you can launch crew on right. Orion um, or like we mentioned, if I don't know, Dragon never becomes a thing, but really or Orion practically to right. load your crew and cargo through into the payload section. Um, so, so you, you can refuel and reload that way. And some of that will also involve docking to gateway instead of Orion, but same concept, go through the docking right, edge, right. reload it with new cargo, potentially brought up on a different starship or brought up on a drag, uh, right. dragon XL or something. Um, but that's how you would refuel and reload between landings. Right. Um, the idea of using the same starship for both landings, that is how the system is designed. You're, I mean, I, I would be surprised if they didn't have 
Well, okay. <laughs> certainly there's the plan going I forward. I am questioning it's just for these everything now. Hold on. So I, I was talking <laughs> earlier about they're going to operate like a fleet yeah. of different variants, right? And if you're talking about <laughs> the Lunar Starship variant, well, if you want more than right. one, where are you going to keep them? They're not going to land on Earth because they can't. Yeah. They don't have the aero services. I guess you could have multiple on the surface at a time. Yeah. You could also have, I don't know if there'd be room. Once Gateway's a thing, you could actually have multiple Dr. Gateway at once. So if you operated like right. two lunar starships. <laughs> that would be ridiculous, by the way. It would multiple be hilarious. Starship. One you lunar starship see, is like... bigger than Gateway. <laughs> Like but that's an interesting stuff. thought. I bet that the long-term goal would basically but, would be let's build yeah. two, and then they can rotate between lunar orbit and like they'll uh, like one initially, and then once gateways the thing, add a second would be my guess. And then if they ever need to like retire one for some reason, that would be like destructive reentry. Or actually, if you need to retire one, don't destroy it. Just leave it on the surface of the moon and use it as a habitat. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Tyler, go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say uh, <laughs> back to uh, Starship and Lunar Gateway uh, rendezvous and docking. So, uh, when you take into consideration the uh, internal uh, surface or the internal volume of both uh, spacecraft, uh, <laughs> so would Starship be docking to Lunar Gateway? It's like a ship can carry Lunar a Gateway boat. But... To Starship, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Yep. Huh. Yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I think that's going to be really interesting. Uh, for me, it comes down to Starship, Lunar Starship, loads up, got astronauts on board, it's in lunar orbit, it lands on the surface of the moon. It clearly has to be able to get back into lunar orbit because it's the lander for the astronauts. It's got to go down and come back up. But after Lunar Starship has gone to the moon, landed on the moon, offloaded its cargo, reloaded its astronauts, don't leave anybody behind, takes back off and gets back into lunar orbit, astronauts transfer to another spacecraft. Orion is the first, is the spacecraft, right? Does Starship, does Lunar Starship have enough Delta V left over to return to low Earth orbit? No arrow braking, nothing like that. Can it make it back to low Earth orbit so that it could be tanked up there again? Because if it can make it back to lunar orbit, but it doesn't have the Delta V left to get back home, hmm. not all the way down to the surface, but at least a low Earth orbit, to use it again, you'd have to send a tanker to the moon right. for it. Right? So that's the, I don't know the numbers on right. that. Somebody could potentially run the numbers and say, oh, well, you know, an empty lunar starship we think would have this much Delta V on it with this much left used for the landing and then this much used to get back to orbit. And then can it burn to get back to Earth and then burn to reinsert itself into a low Earth orbit where it could be serviced, reloaded with cargo in, in LEO, refueled by the tankers in LEO? I I don't. I haven't heard from SpaceX what the plan there is. Has anybody else? The exact technical details, things like um, how much Delta V does it take, how many refuelings will it take? Oh. Yeah. Um, and the cap the big capability is what you're mentioning is like first of all, how many refuelings before yeah. you go to the moon, and then from departing low Earth orbit and going to lunar orbit and then the surface and then back to lunar orbit. After you do all those things, first of all, make sure there's no refueling required for after that. Um, and then once you're back in lower lunar orbit, like you said, can you get back to low Earth orbit for refueling, or do you need any right. refueling in lunar orbit? Right. Um, that is a big question that I think we would like to get answered, and we need that's going to come from SpaceX. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. I, I, I'm not look. All right, it's five o'clock, but this is an entire other <laughs> yeah. conversation um, that we didn't talk about. The choice of Starship <laughs> with the Methalox engines. Mm -hmm. means that lunar ISRU doesn't really help Starship much because you're not going to get a lot of methane from the moon. We've always talked about mining uh, lunar ice, no. the craters that are permanently in shadow, and could we make propellant depots from the ice on the moon? Ice is you H2O, can. you got hydrogen. It's got... not as easy as Mars, but there's a yeah. there, 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 you can... More, more research needed, yeah. but I don't believe it's impossible. I, I, I know that it's technically possible, but on the scale that would be needed to fuel up starships, it's yeah. probably really difficult from what I've read. Um, so is starship sort of missing something there in not being able to take advantage of resources that are more readily available on the moon in terms of propellant depots, right? Is this a situation where in order to refuel starships in the Earth system, right, your, methalog, your methane has to come from the ground, 
and you got to send a Starship tanker up to refuel Starships and all of your fuel for Starship has to come from the ground. Sure, you could get oxygen, liquid oxygen from the moon, ice, crack it, whatever. But the only way to refuel a Starship around Earth is if you bring it up from the ground, except for more research on, you know, are there some inefficient ways to get it from lunar regolith or something like that? I, I don't know. That was an interesting question and one that we'll definitely keep an eye on. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, there was one more super chat. I can't miss yeah. this last super chat here. I'm just going to leave that hanging. We'll do some <laughs> research on that. Let's we'll talk to some experts or something. Um, <laughs> what the choice of starship yeah. means for lunar isru and hydrogen oxygen farming on the moon uh last super chat here if the lunar version of starship never comes back to earth oh well guess what we just answered no we just answered that okay <laughs> what are your thoughts on how it'll be replenished with non-propellant related stuff Is large <laughs> payload capacity diminished without coming back? yeah so greg that's exactly what we were talking about and then also, I think that the, the yeah. document mentioned this. It's like, great, Starship is huge. It can carry so much down to the surface of the moon and bring so many rocks back up and so much science. And then you're going to stuff them into Orion and try to get them home. Yeah. Right? Like Orion has a limited payload capacity in itself. And it doesn't matter yeah. how much payload Starship can bring back up. How are you going to get that home? Um, that is something that we haven't heard the details on yet. And and something that could take advantage of Gateway, you could do some research and processing of things on Gateway without on needing gateway. those like samples or things that you come all the way back to Earth. So um, that's part of the value of something like Lunar Gateway. Um, but you're right that at least initially, there's doesn't matter as long as as long as your lander can carry the same amount that Orion can. Anything above that doesn't actually help you because then you can't right. get it onto Orion. I see what you're saying. Well, for, for return purposes specifically, I mean, certainly there's scientific yeah. gear that would stay there, things that you offload onto the lunar surface, um, the equipment that would be useful going up and down, you know, that, that you don't need to leave or carry all the way back to Earth. But I think that's an interesting point. You're still sort of limited there. Like if Starship can't come all the way back to Earth, it's it's almost like that's a really firm reason that they would need to be able to get Starship back to low Earth orbit. I mm -hmm. imagine like one of those, you know, newspaper cartoons that shows like Starship pulling up to the gateway and it's like, I got 150 tons of regolith here. Where do you want it? No room <laughs> to put it on the gateway, you know? Um, so anyways, just another interesting unknown thought right now. Yeah. <sighs> we could talk about this forever. We could do like a six hour show where it's just, we would tag in and out, just have different NASA space flight people yeah. like offering opinions on things for forever. I think the next Starship stream is probably going to be talking a lot about this stuff, yes, right? Exactly. Ah, uh, but uh, which, by that, the way, now that we're at the yeah. end of the show, could yeah. be no earlier than Monday, I That's believe. True. Right? The next I was... Starship SN15 static fire attempt. Anyway, <laughs> I was going to say yeah. I was going to uh, award contracts for the end of the stream, the exactly. time for the end of the stream, and my budget didn't support it. We didn't have the time to actually cover the stream, and I had to go back to, to just live stream Congress and say I need more time to, to do this. Uh, so we will. We'll offload some of the commentary here to the future. We don't need to pay it right now. Check us on Monday, and we'll talk even more about HLS and Starship and uh, do an even more in-depth of what's going on at Boca Chica because there's tons of stuff happening out there. The super heavy grid fins coming up, and cry SN15 was cryoproofing the tanks. We expect to see a static fire not tomorrow but on Monday uh, for that in a potential flight of SN15 coming up this week, of course, all of those things are things that we're going to cover on the NASA Space Flight Channel. For real. But for now, I've I've bargained my time budget, and I have once again gone over budget. I should not be making any proposals <laughs> to anything. <laughs> Problem is, y'all don't hold me to it, and I just been able to overrun the live stream time budget anytime I want. Uh, but folks, that is going to bring us to the end of NSF Live for this week. Before I forget, I'm going to hop into here, and I want to say a special thank you to all of our members. Uh, we have tons of different members. The font keeps getting smaller and smaller. I'm not exactly sure why that doesn't use all the vertical space on this screen, but whatever. Somebody ring Michael for that one. Um, 
thank you so much for all of our regular members who make these regular coverages, uh, regular shows possible. You know, we'll we'll do a Starship stream. And it's like, oh, Starship stream, you get so many super chats and stuff like that. And for other programs like NSF Live or anything that United Launch Alliance does, we don't get as many super chats. And uh, the memberships are really what able enable us to continue covering all sorts of different space news. And it's not just all Boca Chica, all Starship all the time. So uh, thank you so much to our members for making that possible. Uh, today on NSF Live, we had our fantastic guests and hosts here. Um, over here, Tyler, thank you so much for your debut on NSF Live. Well, thank you for having me, Das. It was a pleasure to be able to come on here and provide some commentary. It's been a lot of fun. Excellent. This is uh, Tyler Gray over on this side. Uh, first time here. Has been out to Boca Chica. Has dialed in for some audio commentary before, but uh, we hope to see you on more NSF Lives in the future. We appreciate you. Also, I can see the blinds now <laughs> on you. Like the blinds, the lighting yeah. we were talking about. The so, sun's coming through. <laughs> yeah, the sun's coming through my window now, and it's kind of Kind of washing me out you, here. You've been so. put in NSF Live jail. Apologies for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is <laughs> this is Tyler, folks. Tyler, so good to have you yeah. here on the stream today. And then over on this side, Thomas Burghart. Thomas, you're no stranger. Always appreciate you taking time out of the weekend to uh, join us for the show. Absolutely happy to be on as always, and happy to babble on about HLS. Super exciting. We'll be talking about this for I think of, I think a while um, across many different live streams. But uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and. Uh, We'll see you guys next time. Yeah, absolutely. Thomas, I can't wait till we get an op uh, opportunity to ask SpaceX some of the questions that kind of got punted during the HLS press conference. There absolutely. were quite a few times where NASA said, ask SpaceX. You know, and then SpaceX the wasn't there for us to ask them. But, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a different complaint for a different time. Yeah. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, folks, that is the end of our show here today. I'm John Galloway with NASA Spaceflight. Uh, if you're watching over on Twitch, which I did not read any Twitch chat today at all, I apologize. You may know me as DOS, but that does bring us to the end of our show. We do these shows just about every week, unless there's something sort of overlapping, like a launch or something happening. Um, but that is what we do, just our live talk show to just literally get some space nerds together and talk about this week in spaceflight. Completely unscripted. You may have noticed we don't uh, have like, oh, yeah. we're going to talk about this for three minutes or anything like that. We literally just talk about things that we're interested in and hope that you enjoy our, our candor and our humor and my drawings sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but for now, most of the time, most of the time, so, uh, John Galloway here, Thomas Berghardt, Tyler Gray, all signing off for NSF Live. We'll look for you on Monday when we hopefully get some Starship testing out from Boca Chica. But for now, we'll see you nerds later. Thanks as always for supporting us. Pressure looks good. Tall enough. Roger, 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 roger. 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 Roger,